Chapter 19 Jade, Somewhere in Space My aching eyes slowly opened, my fickle sleep being interrupted by a thump. I sat up and glanced around. Nina was folding the purple gown that I had made for myself, while Amy was loading armfuls of my undergarments into the trunk. Molly worked on folding the day dresses that I had sewed. I spotted one meant for Amy and spoke up. The violet dress is for you, Amy, I reminded her. Amy shook her head. You've spent the last two weeks indulging me in yoga, cooking for us, and making an exorbitant amount of dresses. The least I can do is allow you to keep the violet one. Amy did have a point. I had managed to sew seven dresses and four gowns for each of my sisters, followed by five more of the jumpsuits. As soon as Lord Peric announced my fate, I tossed all of the energy I possessed into making dresses. It had been an escape that also added to my sister's chances at securing a decent man. Why are my things being packed up? I questioned. Apparently, the captain of our ship sped up to avoid a solar storm, and we arrived a day early, Amy gently said. That meant that my time was up. I was going to be stuck in a harem filled with people that I didn't know. And you let me sleep in? I cried. We just wanted you to get your sleep. Lord Rima is sending a flyer to our ship to pick you up. It will be here in less than an hour, Amy warned. Of course Father wouldn't tell me of the news himself. It was part of the psychological torture. I made a vow to myself that I would either return to Earth or figure out a way to be rid of the harems. Women shouldn't be collected only to be bartered with whenever the men saw fit. We were people that deserved to get a say in our destinies. I got to my feet as Molly placed the stack of dresses into the massive trunk, which had to be the size of my dresser back home. Lord Rima must have sent it, since he probably figured that I was coming to him with many possessions. He would be greatly disappointed once he realized that I was entering his harem with what I made with my own two hands. After taking a quick shower, I combed through my ringlets and plaited my hair into a simple braid. Then I rushed into the room and donned the silver gown that I wore to honor Lord Rima's house color, along with the silver slippers that I managed to make. I eyed the three women that had been my confidants throughout this ordeal. I thought about Sheena and how close we once had been. My chest ached from thinking about the people I'd left behind. Hopefully, the Banes weren't looking for me. Maybe one day, they would be able to move on. Then I thought about how Amy, Molly, and Nina were my family, and I was being forced to leave them behind. A tear trickled from my eye, but I wiped it away. Guys, be safe, I pleaded. Stick together and practice your Narethian. I think that Dad is trying to give Karen an advantage. I'm not sure if it's because of his relationship with Meg, but stay safe, I pleaded. Nina was the first to toss her arms around me, her grip tight. Amy's hug was brief, but filled with affection. Molly hugged me and ended it with a hard back slap. Thanks for making us clothes, Molly said. No problem. I hope I see you guys again. Maybe Lord Rima will allow me to visit. I said as the door was thrown open and a guard dressed in silver stormed in, followed by a transport bot. The mechanical hands lifted my trunk onto the unit and it raced away. Jade, follow me, the guard briskly ordered. He was obviously disinterested in conversing with me. I followed him out of the room and up to the highest level of the ship. Lady Valera was leaning against the onyx wall, her green gown accented by gold dust. I trust that Lord Rima will forgive our debt? The lady demanded. Yeah, the guard said, not wanting to dignify her answer with a full response. Lady Valera put her hands on her hips. My husband did what he could to repopulate Naretha. You can withhold your judgment, since one of his daughters will probably be your wife. She scolded. We need to head back to Lord Rima's estate, the guard said, unmoved by the lady's words. Very well, the lady said before she stepped aside, and the wall that she had been leaning against vanished, revealing a flat, large open area holding mostly green flyers. They were like flying limos, aside from the fact that they didn't have wheels. I eyed the only silver transport. Follow me, the man urged. I walked over to the silver flyer, and the wall of the flyer vanished. I slid in, finding that the trunk was resting beside me. As soon as I buckled up, the side of the space transport reappeared. It looked like the guard had been sent to retrieve me all by his lonesome. 
Maybe Lord Rima didn't value me? I had no idea if this was a positive thing or not. The outer door opened and our flyer was launched into space. I shut my eyes as the flyer picked up in speed. I heard a beeping sound, and then we rapidly descended. It was fortunate that my stomach was empty, since I swore that I would have upchucked all over myself. The abrupt halt of the transport caused my eyes to fly open. There were no windows near me, but I could see out the windshield. We were flying over a city with towering skyscrapers. Now that I was no longer in space, the reality crashed into me. I was heading to an unknown, with no allies. I could no longer plot with my sisters, Amy, Molly, and Nina. They were going to have to master Nerth on their own. My father would use the rest of his daughters if he needed another debt forgiven. He was hoarding us for his own gain. I couldn't help but think that I was better off with the Banes, a family that had been trying to get to know me. I regretted not joining them for New Year's Eve. I highly doubted that I'd ever feel as safe as I was when I was in their home. I was nothing more than a female, someone to be used and controlled. Someone had to do something about this terrible practice. Why couldn't the Nerethians just give us a chance to make our own decisions? Were the Nerethians afraid that some women wouldn't want to have children? That I could understand, since the female population had been attacked by the plague. Jade, we're two minutes out, the driver said. I didn't bother taking a look of my new home from the air. What did it matter? I was going to be imprisoned there whether I looked or not. What are my orders? I asked the guard in English, since that had been the language that he used. Your orders are to go to your quarters and not to speak until you're spoken to. Lord Rima believes in the old ways, when women's tongues were cut out so that he doesn't hear them speak. But the soft-hearted king has refused to reinstate that practice. A shot of fear slammed into my heart. This lord was going to cut out my tongue? Why in the hell had Lord Peric sent me to such a person? But then I had to remind myself of something. To my father, I was a possession, someone to be used. He was in debt, so he traded me. It was obvious that he would do anything to save his own skin. I had to finally accept that Nellie was the only biological parent that ever cared about what happened to me, and she lost her life because of it. Chapter 20 Jade, Naretha, The Rima Estate The flyer landed on a raised platform that was the size of a football field. A tall, hefty man wearing a silver uniform that was tight on him was standing by the marble steps, with a robot standing beside him. I exited the transport, my legs grateful to be touching the ground. It was humid, which was jarring, since it had been winter the last time I stepped on soil. The guard that had been waiting by the platform waved me over and I followed, my knees shaking. What were these people going to do to me? The guard seemed surprised by my appearance, his eyes traveling up and down my body. So Lord Peirk sent Lord Rima one of his elite? What did you do to upset him? The man asked, looking curious. I hated to deceive people. It wasn't in my nature, since the Stephen family had prided themselves on raising an honest daughter. I made this gown myself, I confessed, in near-perfect nerth. Surprise flashed across his face. I thought that you didn't have a translator implanted in you, the guard asked, seeming uneasy about the whole thing. I taught myself Nerth. I'm really good with languages. It took about a week for me to become fluent, I explained. The guard that had transported me shot the husky guard a concerned expression. Look, Jade, you are to be locked in your room until further notice, he announced. Locked? I asked, my chest tight. Lord Rima has seven females that belong to him. He also has a wife. They don't bother with a lot of you unless they are hosting he reported. Now, follow me. Jack, get her bags, the heavy-set guard said. My stomach tight in a ball, I descended the stairs, my legs aching from the exertion. The guard led me down a path that cut halfway through the estate. One side consisted of a towering castle that had four turrets and a drawbridge, and the other half held a series of cottages that were in neat rows of five. I was led to the cottage in the middle of the rows. The guard pressed his thumb to the cottage, and the door flew open. "'You're responsible for making your own meals,' the guard warned, as if most women would jump off a cliff to avoid the kitchen. "'Understood,' I said, 
as I was forced to step into my new accommodations. The door slammed behind me and I jerked. I rushed back to the door and tested the knob, and my stomach sank when I realized that it was locked. Great. Why did the aliens have to trap me in this place without company? I sighed and decided to explore my new abode, which was humble. There was a queen-size bed that took up most of the main room, a kitchen, a closet, and a bathroom with a glass shower. I'd miss taking a bath. By the time I returned from the bathroom, I was shocked to see that my trunk was standing by the bed. With a groan, I unpacked the clothes, and decided to change into the nightgown. It was midday, but I wasn't going to receive any visitors. After changing, I padded into the kitchen and opened the tiny frozen food storage area. I selected some meat and vegetables and made a roast. Then, I decided to prepare a pie, since there was nothing better to do. I ate the meal in the kitchen, storing the rest in a temperature-controlled cooler that rested on the counter. Then I slipped into the bed, where I fell asleep. Jade, wake up! An annoyed voice snapped. My eyes flew open and I sat up, a bit embarrassed that I was in a nightgown. There was a man in the cottage, his back to me. Moments later, Lord Larshak faced me, wearing a gold uniform, which confused me. What happened to the red uniform? I wondered as he took a bite of my roast. His dark eyes lit up with pleasure. What? Lord Larshak asked after swallowing his bite of food. You're in a different uniform this time, I noted. That's beside the point. What are you doing here? Lord Larshak demanded. You didn't hear? Lord Peric traded me to Lord Rima because he was in debt, I explained, which made Lord Larshak scowl at me. It isn't my fault. He deemed me and my five other sisters expendable because our mothers died before he could add them to his harem. You do know he made the women that he impregnated infertile after they gave birth to his children, right? Stay out of trouble, he ordered. Don't do anything stupid. Wait, why are you in a gold uniform? I asked, frustrated that he seemed to hold me responsible for my fate. Does it matter? The nobleman asked before continuing to eat. Not really, but it's really boring here. I don't have any books or company. What's up with that? I demanded. He sighed. Jade, I'm not your source of entertainment. Let me eat my meal in peace. Lord Rima's cook is terrible, he complained. You're the one that woke me up, I countered. If you didn't want to converse with me, you could have let me sleep. My argument agitated him even more. If you shut up, I'll sneak a book into the cottage. I went from annoyed to angry in 2.5 seconds. What was up with Norethian men expecting women to shut up? So you believe in reinstating the Tongueless Women Act? I snapped, my posture straightening. What? First of all, it isn't called the Tongueless Women Act. And number two, the law only pertained to prostitutes, but saloons of old do not exist anymore. He explained, making my eyes roll. You Norethians have no respect for women. Which is stupid, because we are the ones that gave birth to you, I said. Lord Larshak polished off his plate, then went back to the kitchen. You better wash that. To my annoyance, the lord returned with a glass of milk and a plate of pie. I thought you said that I don't respect women. Why should I listen to you? He challenged. You know what, I said as I got to my feet. Call me when you're about to leave. I hustled into the bathroom and slammed the door behind me. There was something about that man that irritated me to no end. I didn't like how I felt being close to him. Waves of nervous energy filled me, making me feel off balance. I quickly splashed my forehead with water. Take a deep breath, Jade, I told myself. He's just another hard-headed, entitled man who thinks that he can use women like chess pieces. You have dealt with your evil father. You can handle a hot, arrogant man in uniform. You know I speak English, right? Lord Larshak asked, and I let out a frightened scream, pressing my hands to my chest. I slowly turned to see the soldier smirking at me. Damn, I preferred his scowl, since it didn't make my heart rate quicken. You came in without knocking? I could have been in the can, or taking a shower, I blurted out in English. I was too flustered to revert back to Nerth. And yet, you were having an interesting discussion. So, tell me, Jade, what makes me arrogant? 
Lord Larshak inquired, his smirk vanishing. Well, um, I... Well, it's the way you carry yourself, and, uh, uh... I shouldn't have insulted him under my breath. Before I could even apologize for being so rude, the soldier cupped my face. Jade, you're being stupid. But to be fair, you have no idea what you're doing, so I won't hold that against you, he told me. I could barely concentrate on his words, since his touch was warm and made me tingle. Stay invisible. After making that insulting speech, he released me and left the bathroom. Seconds later, I heard the door to my cottage close. I stood there for a moment, trying to examine my feelings. I thought that Lord Larshak was rude. He just strolled into my cottage and took leftovers without asking. Now I probably had to cook again the next day. I supposed that making a meal gave me something to do. But still, what about how he had touched me? That felt nice. But what did that mean? I wasn't a romantic that longed for my other half. In my high school, I had been invisible to all but Sheena. Just thinking of her made my heart ache. It would have been nice if I was able to speak to her. How was Sheena doing? Had she gotten into Penn State or Yukon? Did she decide on a major? I shook the thoughts of Sheena from my head and stomped into my room. I frowned when I spotted a book on my bed. I picked it up and discovered that it was a biography of King Gagnon the Great. It was as thick as a phone book and would take me a few days to read. Who left it? Chapter 21 Sheena, Somewhere in Space a swift jab to the ribs served as my alarm clock. I groaned and rolled away from the assault. An eardrum-shattering scream erupted from Amber, who was having a nightmare again. It was day three, and her nights were being haunted by a horror that she refused to talk about. I suspected that the image of her father's head on a platter did play a part. Without glancing at the digital time display hanging on the wall, I knew that it was early. The gadget was nifty. I was able to set the time based on planet, country, and time zone. I got to my feet and didn't blink when Winston ran into the room, a concerned expression on his face. I wasn't sure who arranged the shifts, but a different Najorian entered the room each night when Amber had her nightmares. It was Angelo on night one and Derek on night two. I had felt awkward having him in my room, even though he had been there to check on Amber. Winston was about to say something, but then he grabbed his chest and horror filled his eyes. I rushed over to him and was about to touch him when he shook his head. He brushed past me and rested a hand on Amber's forehead. I was surprised and relieved when her screaming and thrashing stopped. His eyes filled with concern when his gaze met mine. She's afraid to fail you, Winston explained. Fail me? I asked, confused. Was Winston some sort of mind reader? Great. He was one more person that I had to feel awkward around. Mira entered the room, her eyes holding pain when they landed on me. She shook her head, then her expression went blank. Winston was the only word she said before storming off. Great. Was the pair having an awkward mental conversation? This group was weird beyond belief. Nothing had been the same since Winston and Angelo had argued about Kira. Angelo did cook meals, but conversed very little during mealtime. Mira chose to take her meals in her room. When Winston wasn't piloting the ship, he was avoiding us the best he could. Winston sometimes chose to put the ship on autopilot, and the system would alert him if something was amiss. Derek was nice enough, but since I spent most of my time watching movies on the tablet that Winston provided, there wasn't much to say to him. I eyed Winston, who took the liberty of sitting beside Amber on the bed. Well, it looked like I wasn't getting sleep anytime soon. At least he kept her quiet. Maybe I could curl up on one of the recliners and catch some shut-eye. I went over to the wall and tapped on it. A compartment slid open, and I yanked out a spare blanket and quickly left the room. If Winston had some soothing gift, why hadn't he taken the first shift? I walked over to the recliner and hopped into it. I covered myself with the blanket and closed my eyes. It took me little time to fall asleep. Well, falling asleep was what I intended. Instead, I was pushed into another vision of a past event. Derek stared at Angelo, who was sitting on a sectional of an unfamiliar living room. He wore a button-down shirt, tie, and pressed jeans. Derek was a bit more dressed up, in slacks, a white dress shirt, and a blue tie. Angelo's brown eyes were wide with excitement. Shouldn't we be doing something more formal? 
Angelo wondered as he frowned down at his clothes. You know Mira. She isn't interested in anything formal. Besides, neither of our parents are coming. What's the point? Angelo sighed. The point is that you both have chosen one another, Derek's friend said before Winston teleported into the room, his outfit identical to Angelo's. Tormund's got the liquor. Everything is almost ready. Did your folks have a change of heart? Winston asked. No, Derek curtly said as he began pacing. But it doesn't matter. Mira is the woman I want to grow old with. If I'm going to go mad from not finding my compatible, then I'd rather do it with her. What if you find your compatible? Winston asked, uneasy. I will always stay loyal to Mira. She is the one I chose, Derek insisted. Angelo held up a hand. Not today, Winston. You know the two of them are crazy about each other, Angelo said, compassion in his eyes. The door opened and a beautiful woman with long chocolate brown hair rushed in, her dark brown eyes filled with worry. Derek. Oh good, you haven't gone to the meeting room yet, the woman who looked no more than twenty-five said. Derek eyed her with a hopeful expression. Mom, have you decided to come? Derek inquired. Winston shook his head, as if he couldn't believe that Derek had asked such a stupid question. Derek, I'll stand with you when you're right. But if you're wrong, I'll tell you. You're only twenty-two. What is the rush? Why not wait until you're forty to get married? By then... Mom, we've talked about this. Mira is it for me. Even if I found my compatible, it wouldn't matter. I love her. The woman tugged at her black maxi dress. Honey, you've never experienced what having a compatible is like. I love Mira. I wish that she was made for you, but she wasn't. You have to think this through, she pleaded. I want the best for the both of you. Mom, you aren't going to talk me out of marrying the woman of my dreams, Derek replied, his eyes shining with love. Okay. Your father told me that this is hopeless, but I had to try. Despite the fact that you're doing the wrong thing, I'll be here if you need me. I just can't watch you make a big mistake, she said, her moist eyes taking in her son. She swiped her eyes and left the room. Winston's watch beeped moments later. Your mother has excellent timing, Winston said with sarcasm. Let's get you married, Derek let out a sigh. All right, guys, let's get this show on the road, Derek said before walking to the door, excitement lighting up his face. He opened it and walked down a long, wide hallway. At least it's a short walk, Winston joked as Derek entered a room with white walls and two long tables covered in a white tablecloth. Mira leaned against the wall beside Tormund, who looked lost in thought. An uncomfortable-looking middle-aged man stood beside one of the tables. He looked like someone was holding him at gunpoint. All right, the man began. Let's get this abomination of a wedding over with. I'd rather be with the love of my life than suffer through soul sickness alone, Mira fired back, a scowl on her face. Take it easy, sweetheart, Derek said in a placating tone. If you scare Ron off, then there will be no one left to marry us. Mira leapt into Derek's arms and their lips met in a passionate kiss. Save it for when I instruct you two to kiss, Ron protested. The happy couple broke apart and the grumpy officiant gestured at the pair. Derek and Mira held hands. Let's skip to the vows, the man suggested. That's all that's binding anyway. Derek's eyes filled with warmth as he gazed at the bride. I, Derek, take you, Mira to be my eternal spouse. I will love, cherish, honor, and stay true to you. I promise to forsake all others and love you with everything in me. I promise to allow my soul to enter the afterlife only when yours does. Derek then pulled a band out of his pocket and slipped it on Mira's finger. I, Mira, take you, Derek, to be my eternal spouse. I will love, cherish, honor, and stay true to you. I promise to forsake all others and love you with everything in me. I promise to allow my soul to enter the afterlife only when yours does. Great. I'm not sure how either of you can make the promise to die together, since only compatibles die at the same time. It's more like you both will suffer soul sickness. 
Despite the controversies surrounding your union, the king does wish you both luck. Derek, you are one of our top agents, and he understands your decision. This is the part where I present a mating gift to you. But since you aren't mates, your parents didn't put one together for you. So, uh, kiss the bride. Derek and Mira weren't bothered by his words. Their lips met in a frenzy, and their friends clapped while the man officiating the wedding rolled his eyes. He shook his head and teleported out of the room. Winston glared at the spot where Ron had stood, but then tossed his hands in the air. It was obvious that he found the situation hopeless. I'll love you forever, Mira, Derek said. Then I was shoved out of the vision. I sat in the recliner for a moment, unsure how to process what I saw. Derek and Mira were married? Their parents hadn't approved of the union. But what happened after they said, I do? Had Derek discarded Mira as soon as he found me? Wait. What if Derek was torn between his wife and his compatible? This was something straight out of Springer. And wait a minute. Where did this leave us? I couldn't hook up with a man who loved someone else. I utterly refused to be anyone's second best. But did I have a choice? How did soul sickness work? Deciding that I wasn't going to get any answers by sitting on my ass, I tossed the blanket onto the floor and got to my feet. I power walked to Derek's room, the adrenaline surging within me. I knocked on the door and he answered it a minute later. Sanity, please save me. The man was in a towel. His dark hair was dripping wet. A towel hung low on his waist. I eyed his damp chest, and despite it all, my stomach flipped. Apparently, my body wasn't opposed to me being a no-good, home-wrecking hussy. I concentrated on what I was going to say to him. Chapter 22 Sheena, Somewhere in Space Derek, did you forget to tell me something? I asked, a fake smile on my face. I'd give him the chance to be honest with me. He eyed me and his face paled. It took all of two seconds for me to remember that Derek could read minds. These damn aliens sucked. Sheena, give me a minute to change, and I'll talk to you. Derek insisted. I wasn't inclined to make him leave so easily. Have you heard of the game Naked Confessions? I asked. Derek shook his head. Well, my ex-boyfriend Frank told me that people told the truth when they were naked. I... Anger made his jaw clench, which caught me off guard. You got naked with another man? Derek roared. Despite the shame that suddenly filled my gut, I stood my ground. Oh, shut up. You married another woman. You didn't even bother trying to find me. If I hooked up with a guy or two, it shouldn't matter. Okay, I had only had one horrid sexual encounter that I didn't long to repeat. But I decided to make Derek think that I was experienced. You can't be serious. Derek protested. You dared talk to me about your lover? First of all, Frank ended up playing on a different team. Naked Confessions was just a game to him. Derek nodded, the anger not leaving his face. So I'm coming in here. You'll tuck yourself under the sheets and tell me everything. If something's too hard, you won't be able to teleport away. Or I could just get dressed and tell you the truth, Derek suggested. Fat chance of that happening. I fired back, anger taking hold. The first thing you should have done was mention your wife. Derek winced, but shoved his door open, and I stomped in. I glanced around the room and was immediately intrigued. There was an easel set up in a corner, and a painting resting on it. I smirked when I saw that it was an incredibly detailed painting of me. His desk held a couple of sketches that were half the size of the painting of me. I walked over to the desk and snatched up the first sketch and gasped. The likeness of Lord Peirk stared back at me. I picked up another drawing and saw Shala, the violent Janton princess. The squeaking of the mattress alerted me that Derek was in bed. I turned to face him and my mouth went dry. Wife be damned, that man was one fine specimen. I sat beside Derek and peered down at his face. So you had a vision of my wedding? He asked me. Yes, the wedding that you forgot to mention, I snapped. Derek closed his green eyes and took a deep breath. In the beginning, I had no idea what to do. Finding you was a shock, but I knew that I couldn't let you go. So I went home and talked to Mira. I told her what it was like to find my compatible. It's all-encompassing. 
I couldn't deal with feeling your emotions but never knowing why you felt that way. And it's not just about feeling your emotions. There is something about you that just pulls me in. It may have been shady, but I had to remind Derek what he had told Mira on their wedding day. I will love, cherish, honor, and stay true to you. I promise to forsake all others and love you with everything in me. I promise to allow my soul to enter the afterlife only when yours does. That's what you told Mira, Derek. You promised to be her eternal spouse. And you're telling me that those feelings suddenly went away? I challenged. Derek closed his eyes and took a deep breath. Sheena, Mira will always have a place in my heart. But Mira isn't my soulmate. Derek pointed out. But I'm still the afterthought. The person that you decided to date because... Because you are my soulmate, Sheena. You have to believe in that. Am I supposed to feel your emotions? I wondered. From what I've heard, your end of the bond will form after we make love. Derek explained, which made my body tingle. But then I reminded myself that Derek wasn't ready to start something up with me. How long have you guys been apart? I asked. Mira and I had problems before I met you. I moved out two months ago. We were trying to work things out, but... Well, then I decided that maybe it would be best to call it quits. I don't get it, I said. You both looked like a happy couple. What went wrong? Derek let out a groan. Mira cheated on me with one of our friends. I work with the king. I'm on his investigation team. That's time-consuming work. Mira was lonely, since I couldn't spend much time with her. And so I came home one day and caught her making out with Winston. The pilot! But you guys are friends, and Mira hardly talks to him. I don't get it, I blurted out. Yeah, it was hard to forgive Winston. I guess it all started innocently enough. You know how that works. Mira was upset. She clung to Winston. Mira needed something fixed. She asked Winston. Mira wanted to see a movie. She asked Winston. I wasn't there for her. I got that. She could have told you that, I argued. I could have read it from her mind, if I cared to force myself through her mental shields. He countered, which made me nod. You have a point there. So once you caught them, you moved out, and what? Did you see a therapist? Yes. But things were never the same after that, Derek confessed. When was your wedding? I asked. February 1st, he responded. Are you two separated? I asked. Mira and I are divorced, Derek assured. I never would have pursued a relationship with you if I were still married to Mira. Does Mira refuse to eat with us because she wants to avoid us? I asked. Hartley but she's also not comfortable around Winston. From how I understand it, Winston felt so guilty about what happened that he decided to distance himself from her. And you forgave Winston? I asked, in utter disbelief. I did, Derek responded. Then I guess you really didn't love Mira. If you did, Winston would have been disfigured, I pointed out. Besides all of that, you should have told me about your ex-wife. It never came up. It isn't like we've had a chance to speak, Derek argued. Fine, I replied. But I don't think that you have been broken up long enough. Derek frowned at me as I considered my options. On one hand, Derek belonged to me. On the other hand, I wasn't sure if all of him belonged to me. What do you mean? Derek demanded. I mean that we need to focus on finding Jade. After that... I'll consider going on a date with you. But until then, we're friends. Derek tensed. Sheena, I'm sorry that I didn't mention Mira. We- I held up a hand. Look, I need time, Derek. And it's obvious that you do as well. I pointed out. Unless you can look me in the eye and tell me that you no longer love Mira. Derek glanced away, the shame on his face making my heart ache. Nice talk, Derek. I said, before getting to my feet and leaving the room. My eyes opened and I blinked in surprise. The end credit music to a romantic comedy that I had been dying to see was blaring through my wireless headphones. 
The tablet was beside me on the bed. I had fallen asleep during the movie. It wasn't surprising, since Amber's nightmares had been interrupting my sleep. And besides, my mind most likely wanted an escape from the drama on the ship. It was all beginning to sound like the start of a stand-up comics monologue. So, a woman, her soulmate, and the soulmate's ex-wife all go on a mission to try to rescue someone. I felt like an utter fool, like everyone had been privy to a secret. Amber, who had spent the day with Winston, hurried in the room. The comet slipped out before I could stop it. Since you no longer want to spend your days guarding me, why not sleep in your own room? Maybe then I'll actually get some sleep, I quipped. The guilty expression on her face made me pause. Oh, I'm sorry. I came in earlier, but you were knocked out. And you slept straight through lunch. But you're right. I should have been keeping an eye on you. A memory of what Winston told me rushed into my mind. She's afraid to fail you, he had warned me. And here I was complaining about her inattentiveness. Right. I sort of stuck my foot in my mouth. I'm just a bit moody because Derek decided to bring his ex-wife on this mission, I replied. Amber's mouth dropped open, her brown eyes so wide that I thought they were going to pop out of her head. Excuse me? She asked as she plopped down on the bed beside me. A longing for Jade crashed into my chest. My friend would have known how to comfort me. She should have been the one helping me navigate this situation. For the millionth time, I felt terrible for lying to her. Winston came in after you started screaming, and he soothed you. I decided to get some sleep on one of the recliners. I took a blanket to cover myself. Instead of falling asleep, I had a vision of Derek and Mira's wedding. Holy hell! Why is Mira willing to help you? Her husband left her for you. What does she get out of going on this mission? Amber rapidly asked. Damn it. I had been so focused on how I was feeling that I hadn't considered asking myself why Mira had come along on this mission. I didn't think of that, I reluctantly admitted. I'm a knight. We mostly think of strategy. It's how we were made. Speaking of which, something occurred to me, Amber said. What would that be? I wondered. The Janton don't speak English, and yet you were able to understand them. Derek told me that the vision that he saw in your mind was in the Janton tongue. I remember Mom telling me that oracles can speak all of the known Earth languages, that it was part of their skill set. Amber had a point. I had understood the Janton Emperor and his sister without issues. Why didn't Mom tell me this fact? I complained. You know how your mother is. She doesn't like spoon-feeding you information. She probably wanted you to discover this on your own. Did Derek tell you that he made sketches of all the people in my visions? I asked. No. He sketched the people that killed my father? Amber asked, her eyes filling with grief. Yes, I said, my throat tightening. Amber, I'm sorry for what I said. I just... I guess I took the crap with Derek out on you. You hate apologizing, Amber noted. So you must be really sorry. It's okay, Sheena. I figured that something must have happened when you spent the whole day in here. Angelo suspected something, too, because he made your favorite food. Fajitas? I hopefully asked, excitement lighting up my eyes. Yep. You have the option of chicken, shrimp, or both, Amber told me, which was enough of a motivator to get out of bed. Besides, hiding in my room didn't make Derek more divorced. Amber whistled as we entered the kitchen. Hey, Sheena, Angelo greeted. Winston and Derek were already at the table, indulging in Angelo's wonderful cooking. I eyed Winston and wondered how a guy like him could betray Derek in such a way. Like you wouldn't have betrayed Jade if your heart wasn't involved? Mira sneered. I spun to face her, a wave of hatred consuming me. My hand moved without warning and I punched Mira square in the nose, blood spurting from the injury. Amber was in front of me, her hands glowing. A hand rested on my shoulder. It's the bond, Sheena. Take a deep breath, Angelo coached. I didn't want to listen to him. The memory of the wedding slammed into my mind. I, Mira, take you, Derek, to be my eternal spouse. I will love, cherish, honor, and stay true to you. I promise to forsake all others and love you with everything in me. I promise to allow my soul to enter the afterlife only when yours does. 
Mira had made a vow that she had no business making. How dare another female promise to be my soulmate's eternal spouse? Sheena, it's okay, Angelo said. Derek belongs to you. Mira is in his past. Let me through, Winston, Derek shouted. No. Your touch will make her want to complete the mating bond. She isn't ready for that, Winston reasoned. Sheena, snap out of it, Amber shrieked. If you kill Mira, that will be one less person able to help Jade. 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 The image of my best friend doused the anger I felt. I instinctively brushed the scar on my stomach with my fingertips. A tear ran down my cheek, the sorrow nearly flooding me. My sweet best friend was in the hands of aliens, and I had to get her back. What happened to me? I asked Angelo, who had a relieved expression on his face. How did you find out about the wedding? Angelo asked. I had a vision, I softly explained, and Winston swore. Angelo wrapped a consoling arm around me. He probably understood more than most what it was like to see something as heartbreaking as your compatible giving themselves to another. Derek didn't think he would ever find you. I'm sorry that you had to see that, Angelo said. Do you feel calm enough to eat dinner with us? Do you need Mira to leave? No, I replied. I'm not angry anymore. What was that anger, Angelo? Does it just appear out of nowhere? It was the first time you saw her since you had your vision? Angelo inquired. Yes, I rasped out. Then that's why you responded that way. I'm going to let you go, he said. I nodded and was relieved when I walked past Mira without wanting to wring her neck. She had a napkin pressed to her nose, and seeing that made me feel guilty. Sorry, I said, my voice cracking. I wasn't sure what came over me. Mira nodded, which was the best I was ever going to get from her. I plopped down beside Derek, who immediately reached for my hand. Our fingers interlaced, and I was able to fully relax. I was too emotionally exhausted to pull away from his touch. Steak or shrimp? Angelo asked, in a bright tone. Both, I said with excitement. He laughed and prepared my plate for me. Mira slowly approached the table, her hands out in a I-mean-no-harm gesture. Her nose was unblemished, which told me that Najorians healed quickly. You can sit. I'm not angry anymore, I assured her. She nodded and sat across from me. Amber sat beside Winston as Angelo plopped a heaping plate of fajitas and rice and beans in front of me. Yay! I cheered, before handling my fajita with one hand and taking a big bite. Angelo served me and Amber before serving himself. Sheena, are you ready to talk business? Amber asked. What business? I wondered. Remember? I was telling you that oracles know how to speak all known earth languages. You did understand the vision that was in Janton. Can you read and understand the Janton and the Narethian languages? Everyone glanced at me with interest. I don't know, I responded. Mira is a hacker. I wonder if you both can work together to find dirt on our enemy, Amber said. I eyed Mira, whose eyes were filled with interest. Fine, but I'll have to leave if the anger comes back, I insisted. I'm so sorry for hitting you. If you bonded, that wouldn't happen, Mira said, disapproval in her eyes. Was Derek's ex-wife telling me to sleep with him? This was another level of weird. Chapter 23 Gwen, Naretha's Atmosphere We're here! Anastasia cried, though our spaceship had been orbiting Naretha for half a day. I smiled and entered her room, which was nothing more than boxes and suitcases. Father had forced everyone to pack their own bags. He said it was because things worked differently in Naretha. The nobles didn't have servants. But I knew what most of my siblings didn't know. Lord Peirk was nearly destitute. Fathering hundreds of daughters, then trading them for either money or for debt forgiveness was his best option. I stared at Anastasia and wondered what her fate would be. She had been the only sibling to show me any sympathy for the way that mother had been torn away from me. I would protect her, if it were possible but the first thing I needed to accomplish was tracking down information about Mom's welfare. If she survived the pregnancy, I'd be able to extract her. 
I'm not all that excited, I said as Anastasia's mother, Claire, rushed into the room, dressed in her usual black garb. Her eyes held an emptiness that was all too familiar to me, but I didn't think that Anastasia noticed how empty her mother was. Did the bots take your things yet? She inquired. Sure did, I said, shooting her a wide grin. How are you today, Claire? Stressed out. We're going to live on an unfamiliar planet, and I don't even have a language chip. So yeah, I'm not sure how... Anastasia shot her mom a wide-eyed glance that was startling. Claire paled, then began speaking again. Not that I'd ever question your father. He is wonderful, and... My blank look must have made her pause. I'm just as nervous, I admitted. I don't know why all of us can't have a language chip. But I think that the chips are really expensive, I said, as a robot came into the room and lifted a suitcase in each hand and lumbered out of the room. I wondered about the fear that was plastered on her face, then I recalled something. Dad shut off the audio feed to our rooms two hours ago, I informed Claire, who nodded. Anastasia let out a curse and covered her mouth. You mean Dad was eavesdropping on our conversations the whole time? Anastasia squeaked. Yeah. How did you think the punishments worked? Anastasia let out a groan. I thought that you were reading our minds or something. Anastasia hesitantly replied, which made my heart ache. You guys thought I was ratting my own mother out? I asked, shocked. Well, um... Uh... I'm sorry, Gwen. We were all wrong. Anastasia said, regret on her face. My mother thought this too, didn't she? I asked, horror plain on my face. She did, Anastasia forced out. I hope that one day you'll get to tell her what was really going on. Her words were no comfort to me. The thought that my mother believed that I would betray her in that way was crushing. No wonder she thought that I had no soul. And father probably knew that you guys assumed that I was reporting your every move, I bitterly said as the transport bot walked into the room and collected more of the boxes. What does he get out of us fearing you? Anastasia wondered. I wished that I could have explained the new position that I had been offered. But father wasn't going to reveal that until the social gathering that we were going to be forced to attend. We were the last of the Peirks that were landing on Aretha. I had no idea if father was planning on expanding his harem. And it wasn't like he would share that kind of information with me. Because he would never want us to be friends, I explained. Think about it, Anastasia. What would happen if Lex and David actually got along? Lex wouldn't be such an ass? Anastasia questioned. Then neither of them... I stopped speaking when I heard footsteps coming down the hallway. Moments later, Karen stood there, a wide grin on her face. Gwen, Dad told me to get you. It's our time to go down to the transport, Karen announced. Glancing at Karen reminded me that she knew what those evil doctors were going to do to my mother, and yet she said nothing. I knew in that moment I could never trust Karen. Okay then, Anastasia, I'll see you later, I said, before following Karen out into the hallway. What a charming view, Meg gushed as soon as the flyer escaped Naretha's atmosphere. Meg and Karen occupied the seats across from mine while I was stuck without a seatmate, thanks to the two horrid women I was sharing my flyer with. I longed to see my mother so that I could tell her how much I loved her and how sorry I was for everything. But I couldn't because she was out of reach. It is, Karen said, excitement in her voice. I wonder what kind of suite we will stay in. Lord Peirk has ensured me that our suite will be the largest by far, Meg bragged. I bet, <laughs> Karen laughed. Gwen, what have you been up to these couple of weeks? I scowled in Karen's direction. What have I been up to without a mother? I asked. Well, you see, I've been living in misery while worrying about her. Tell me, Karen, why did you choose for me to lose my mother? My words were filled with so much hatred that it even startled me. I don't know what you're talking about, Karen said, but Meg rolled her eyes. It was either me or her. I couldn't pick Anastasia's mother, since she'd had a hysterectomy. I knew not to bother with Lex's or David's mothers. Those kids are powerful. You're an idiot who spends her time in other people's heads. You're no threat to me, she explained. My hands suddenly began glowing, which got a scream out of Karen. The anger that filled me made me want to burst. 
I had to calm down, as my anger was lighting my skin on fire. Meg paled when the seatbelt I was wearing melted away. I stormed over to her and lifted a hand. You meant to say that I wasn't the bigger threat. My blood sang a delicious song of vengeance and desperation. I could snap that slimy woman's neck for what she did. It would be easy, and everything would be made right. I could lay waste to the entire palace, punish Lord Perk for everything he did to me. It would be so easy to burn his lady as well. She allowed this travesty to take place. But then I remembered my mother's words. I hope you never find out what you're truly capable of. I glanced down at the light that shone on my skin and knew that I had to do damage control. I eyed Meg, whose surgically augmented face was the picture of horror. I made eye contact and spoke a command. You're terrified of me because you realized that I could control minds. You know nothing about my powerful light. You will not mention any of my conversation with anyone. Karen's eyes widened. You're kidding! You can control people? Karen cried. That's what I was trying to do when Lex smacked me over the head, I explained, my eyes on Karen. I wanted Lucy to be the one, but Mom wouldn't listen. You have to believe me, Gwen. You're my sister. I'm sorry, Karen pleaded. I took a deep breath. You won't mention any of this to Lord Perk? I asked. Hell no, Karen replied, her eyes hard. Your power is our trump card. You should probably change the memory of the pilot, though. I nodded and did what Karen suggested. I let her think that she was in control for now. I strolled back to my seat and plopped down on it. Meg, fall asleep, I mentally ordered, and the wretched woman began snoring. Tell me only the truth, I mentally ordered Karen. Can I trust you? I demanded. Of course you can. We're blood. I'm only playing Dad's game until I can hightail it out of his house. Do you hate me? I questioned. No, Gwen, I don't hate you, Karen said. What about Anastasia? I love her, Karen responded. What about hope and faith? Why did you string them along? That was Mom's idea. She said that it would prove that I would be a good leader. I couldn't stand them, Karen admitted. I was about to ask about Molly, but then I realized that the flyer was descending. Karen, can I trust you with my secret? I asked. Yes, Karen said. What's your biggest secret? I wanted to know. I purposely dropped a berry in Lady Valera's oatmeal. She's allergic to berries of all kinds. I want her dead. Great, Karen may love me, but isn't above murdering unsuspecting ladies. Chapter 24. Sheena. Somewhere in Space. I slept through the night, the dreams of Derek consuming me from the inside out. His lips, his arms, the scent of pine that clung to his lightly stubbled face. It was easy to allow myself to enjoy these things about him, since I didn't need to face the hard truth. After being pulled into reality by my stupid alarm clock, I got out of bed and took a long, hot shower before changing into yoga pants and a t-shirt. Then I rushed into the kitchen and saw Mira sitting there with a tablet in front of her. I stood there like an idiot, my eyes studying the woman that Derek had broken every rule to marry. She was a beauty. Any Hollywood director would be thrilled to hand her a business card. Her dark eyes held intelligence that I would never possess. Out of the two of us, Jade was the smart one. Until that very moment, I had always accepted the fact that critical thinking wasn't my strong suit. Maybe that's what Derek liked most which meant that he would find me lacking. Your tablet is right there, she said, pointing to the tablet across from hers. I stopped staring at her and sat down and tapped on the screen. The Janton sanitation plans? I questioned. What does that have to do with anything? The screen changed, which made me realize that Mira had somehow gained control of the tablet. Meeting Agenda 203. That's useful, Mira said. I was able to hack into the device of one of Emperor Tulda's officers. The system is written in Nerth, which is one of the most common languages in this galaxy, but his notes are all in the Janton language. Maybe we should start by reading the meeting agenda. At least then we'd understand what the priorities of the Janton are, I suggested, which made Mira nod. Maybe we can find something about the Kigor port, since Amber really wants to stop there. The Janton own the port. 
Good plan, I agreed as the screen shifted again. Want me to read this aloud? I asked Mira. Sure. We'll check out a couple of these. Then I'll continue my efforts in trying to find out information about Naratha. I can't find much, but with the images that Derek gave me, I can probably find something. Hope filled my gut, propelling the belief that we could find Jade. It all seemed possible all of a sudden, though I knew that I was being foolish. There were probably millions of people on the Narathian planet, and we had no allies there. How in the hell could we get allies? I had no idea how to accomplish the feat, but I was sure that we could at least blackmail someone if Mira could come up with any dirt on a prominent member of the alien race's society. Item 1, I read when Mira opened up the first agenda. Emperor told his marriage to a Janton female of his choosing. Item 2, the wedding date for Princess Shala and Prince Zemeyer. Item 3, should the King of Naretha be put under house arrest? Item 4, the Annex of Earth. I paused upon reading that item. The Jantons would not intrude on our planet. They may have been a warrior race, but the Caster's Guild wouldn't allow this travesty to occur. Mira let out a curse that was so loud that Derek and Winston teleported into the room. Derek rested a hand on my shoulder, while Winston plopped down beside Mira. Did she threaten you? Winston asked, which made me roll my eyes. No. The Jantons have the possible annexation of Earth on their meeting agenda, I explained, having the feeling that we would have to assassinate Emperor Tolda, since the man was clearly a loose cannon. Oh, Winston said. So you can read the Janton language? Sure can, I said, as Derek slid into the chair beside me. Winston arched a brow. Being that close to her could make her go into a rage, Mira warned as the anger began brewing. I grabbed Derek's hand and the negative emotions subsided. We need Amber and Angelo. This mission just got more complicated, I announced. Derek nodded, then moments later, Amber ran into the room, followed by Angelo. What's going on? Amber asked, her eyes wide with excitement. I had to remind myself that she was a knight. That type of caster enjoyed the thrill of combat. The Jantons are contemplating annexing Earth, I replied, which made Amber let out a snort. Yeah, with all of the different governments. Good luck, she sneered. Despite how passive King Rayon is, I doubt that he would let that happen, Angelo added, his words causing Derek to scowl. Rayon is a good leader who has the survival of his people on his shoulders, my soulmate protested. Yeah, right. If Rayon was a good leader, then he would have taken the attack on his people more seriously. Sometimes leaders test boundaries, and if you don't push back, they end up crossing the line. Amber tossed out. Rayon has the Najorians on Naretha to think of, Derek argued. Doubt it, Mira fired back. He lost contact with that colony ages ago. That's just a rumor, Derek argued. The Najorians on that planet are widely left alone because they all have soulmates. Rayon doesn't need to bother with forcing them to mingle with other colonies. Lucky them, Winston sarcastically said. Sheena, don't mind your soulmate. He's definitely drank the Kool-Aid. Despite my soul wanting to always side with Derek, my mind knew different. I took his hand, thinking of a logical compromise. We can check on the Narathian colony after we rescue Jade, I offered. And don't forget the humans that may be stuck in cages, Amber chimed in. Okay, let's read the next agenda, I offered. It will give us an idea of how soon the Jantan plan to invade Earth. Everyone nodded, and I continued reading. Three hours later, and we got the gist of things. Some of the advisors urged the Emperor to leave Earth alone. The planet was way too overpopulated, and their technological capabilities were unknown. Besides, their infrastructure wasn't made for people their size. But Emperor Toldo was on the high of the victory he earned when his empire battled Naretha and the king surrendered. He believed that he could annex such a primitive planet and make the Earthlings slaves. Slavery was apparently a dishonorable act to most of the Janton warriors. At least the race believed in conquering a planet the honorable way, if there was such a thing. Mira also found the schematics to the Kigor spaceport, and with my help, we were actually able to hack into the video feed. We clicked on one from one of the gambling rooms. Lord Peurk sat at a large table in what looked like a high chair. Across from him sat two giants. A different angle showed a group sitting on a massive couch. 
Mira switched to a different camera, and I let out a gasp. That's him, I cried. That's the guy that killed Max! Amber focused on her tablet, her icy glare telling me that the man in the shop was going to have his reckoning soon. That girl looks a lot like Jade, Mira noted when the view changed to a girl with short hair and a bored expression on her face. We saw another girl around my age dressed in a gown that either had a corset or she was wearing an effective waist trainer. When the camera images changed to a familiar face, my eyes bugged out. I'd recognize that girl anywhere, since Amber had a picture of her on her dresser. Amber's stepsister Gwen sat there with a determined expression on her face. Her mother, Rose, was sitting beside Max's murderer, who held her on a leash. That image filled my soul with anger. That bastard would die for that. Can you try to get audio? Winston asked, sounding intrigued. I can try, Mira said. Then she brought up a menu. The blue button says audio feed, I told her. She clicked on it, and voices traveled to us. Narathian, Angelo clarified. I'll translate, I offered. Mira restarted the entire video, and I began to translate. No, you jackhole! Amber shouted when Lex knocked Gwen out. She was trying to save Rose! Thank you, son. You'll be greatly rewarded, Lord Petrick said. Anastasia, you can release your telekinetic hold on her. The beauty with the suspected corset raised a hand, and Gwen fell to the floor with a thud. Please, don't kill her! Rose pleaded in English. It's your life that you should be worried about, the giant holding Rose's leash said. Rose shook, tears beginning to fall down her face. Lord Perk gestured to the door. Take her. Rose was always useless anyway. Don't worry, Rose. I'll make sure that Gwen will never see you again, Max's murderer taunted. I hate you, Rose cried out. Kids, let's leave the giants to their business. The evil alien criminal snapped. Lex slung Gwen over his shoulder and left the room, followed by the telekinetic in a corset, the plain-looking girl, and the girl that resembled Jade. The other guy in the group shot Rose a sympathetic glance before leaving the room. Moments later, Rose glanced up at the camera, determination filling her face. Sheena, Lena told me that you would be watching, Rose said in English. Come and get me. Moments later, Rose's hands glowed, the Janton not even realizing that they had a knight among them. My heart soared when she disintegrated the giants with two blasts, then strolled out of the room. Holy crap! Amber shrieked. Rose is a knight? Why didn't she ever say anything? She didn't want Lord Petrick knowing that she had that kind of power, I said, knowing that I spoke the truth. I'll speed up the ship. We've got to get to Rose. Maybe she can help us. Winston said, before getting to his feet. Chapter 25 Gwen, Naretha, The Peirk Estate One look at the luxurious palace clarified why my father was in so much debt. The landing strip alone was as large as a football field. After stepping out of the flyer, we were greeted by aggressive heat. Karen winced and rubbed her forehead, while Meg, whom I had woken up five minutes ago, scowled. I need a parasol to protect me from the sun, Karen's mother whined. Do you think that Lord Petrick will provide me a servant to do something like that? Our pilot, a skinny bald man, shot Meg a disbelieving glance. Typically, servants help with the running of the household, he corrected. Then he eyed Meg's footwear with concern. We have to walk to the palace. Will you be able to do that in the contraption you are wearing? These are designer heels. There are... I don't have an idea of what you mean, the man said, his English slow and accented. Don't interrupt me. I'll have you know that I'm Lord Petrick's favorite. You would be wise to be respectful to me, Meg snapped. The bald man shot Meg a pitying look that made my stomach twist. Let's just go, I urged. Not until a ground transport gets sent for us, Meg fired back. We don't have any ground transports. The Lord had to sell them five years ago, the pilot argued. I decided to get it over with and began walking down the steps that led to the sidewalk, Karen following close behind me. Do you think that your mother will follow us? I wondered. No, she's going to sit in the flyer until a ground transport can come for her. She probably wants me to wait with her. I don't think you should do that, I warned. 
I have a feeling that things will be different now that we're on Naretha. Karen bit her lip. I don't want to leave you alone with a man we don't know. Besides, Mom will be fine, she told me, though Karen didn't look so sure. You don't believe that any more than I do, I said as the bald man ran down the steps. I'm assuming that Dad has a favorite on every voyage. I heard Lady Valera joke as much with Kala, my sister explained. The bald man nodded in agreement before leading us down the path that split the Perk estate in half. We walked for a mile, the looming palace getting larger with every step. By the time we reached the front steps, Karen and I were about to fall over. The bald man gestured to a row of chairs on the lawn. Most of them were filled with people of varying ages who were chatting among themselves. I linked my arm through Karen's and we approached the group. A short brunette with tan skin marched over to us, a smirk on her cruel face. She was dripping in diamonds, her hair in an updo that had gold strands twisted into it. Her brown eyes were filled with hostility, which made me believe that this wasn't going to be a charming introduction. I'm Leah, Dad's firstborn, she said. Where are your mothers? Mine is on Janton, I replied, which made Leah nod. Right. And you? Are you one of the useless? Leah taunted. No, my mom is in the flyer. The walk was too much for her. Karen explained, her eyes filled with the same animosity. Let me guess. Your mother is his favorite? Oh, you poor misinformed idiot. What Dad does on the ship doesn't matter. He has one favorite, and it has been my mother for decades. In fact, she was the one that came up with the brilliant plan of a harem. They met by chance, and she agreed to be his second wife. So don't delude yourself by thinking that your mother won't be punished. Leah laughed. Look at you. So plain and boring. I bet your mother is just as plain. Our father favors the ugly one so that my mother won't be jealous. I was about to use my gift on her, but I thought better of it. What if Leah had a way to counteract my gift? Karen glanced at me, her insecurity written all over her face. So what is this? I asked, bemused. Are you the lady of the house? Oh, I will be, Leah boasted. My husband and I live on the estate. I plan on securing a place of honor. She was like Karen on crack, which was really annoying. Are we done here? I asked, wanting to escape the hostility. Oh, I'm done with you, Gwen. You're no threat to me. You're going to be Lady Valera's pet until she tires of you. Karen's eyes landed on me, betrayal in her gaze. Dad told me not to tell anyone, I defended, and she nodded in understanding. Farewell. Leah said as I heard a commotion. I spun to see a limping Anastasia making her way to the group, followed by a disheveled Claire. I grabbed Karen's arm and escorted her to a seat between two women who had to be in their late twenties. The pale-skinned woman who sat beside me greeted me with a genuine smile. Don't mind our sister. She enjoys riling us up. You're beautiful, so we'll be married off soon, she assured me. I felt Karen tense beside me, and I couldn't blame her for the reaction. Thus far, the harem hadn't been a pleasant place. I stared at Leah, who was just as disrespectful to Anastasia, who began crying. When David and Lex walked in, Leah merely nodded, and Obi stepped forward and ushered my two brothers to a corner. Moments later, laughter reached us. It appeared that Obi's reception was more welcoming than the one that Leah gave us. Molly, Nina, and Amy and Lena were the last to come in. Leah stepped up to Lena, who scowled and gave her the finger. Then she pivoted on her heel and walked away from Leah, leaving the three rejects in front of the queen. The group quieted enough for me to hear the conversation. I'm Leah, and I wanted you to know how things go around here, Leah announced. Uh, yeah, you're another stuck-up version of Karen, but older. I got it. Now stop with the crap. I don't want to hear it, Molly said. Leah eyed Molly's blue gown and frowned. Take off your dress. I want it, she ordered. No, Molly replied, her head held high. Five women, all in their mid-twenties, fanned out behind Leah, Leah's backup. This was getting out of hand. Take off the dress, Leah ordered for a second time. Molly rolled her eyes and flipped Leah off. Bring it on, Lana, Molly snapped. It's Leah, Leah corrected, before Leah flicked her finger and Molly was tossed into the air. Molly crashed to the lawn with a thud. Nina covered her mouth, her eyes going wide with panic. Molly quickly got on her feet and charged Leah with such speed that I barely made her out. 
She tackled the woman to the ground and straddled her. Molly began raining punches down on Leah, who lost focus on her telekinesis. A short woman charged Molly, her eyes blazing with anger. Amy leaped over Molly's head and kicked the woman square in the chest. The kick propelled her into the air and she slammed into the group of women that had rushed to Leah's defense. Gwen, my father mentally shouted. He was sitting in a throne-like chair that was being carried by two burly men. I gasped out loud when I noted that Meg was being carried by two men. She was in her bra and panties and was struggling against the men. Karen screamed and was halfway out of her seat, but then Anastasia looked at her and she was restrained. I eyed Molly and took hold of her will. Molly got to her feet and walked over to Amy. Leah's face was battered, and it didn't look like she was even conscious. The girls that had been hit by the propelled body didn't look much better. I'll deal with this later, my father said. But now, it looks like we have an example to make. Thomas. A guard that was standing by Obi strutted forward, a long sword in his hands. Let me tell you something, ladies. Meg here is old and barren. She's cruel and disobedient. I can't marry her off to anyone. So she'll be the best example. Before I could blink, the soldier raised his sword and decapitated Meg. Karen let out an anguished wail that would haunt me as long as I lived. No one else made a sound, probably because no one wanted it to be their heads next. I was stunned, disbelieving of the sight in front of me. Ladies, here is how things work. You will obey me or die, my father declared. Even Molly, who enjoyed talking back to authority figures, was speechless. Chapter 26 Gwen, Naretha, the Peirk Estate After the horrible events on the lawn, the youngest of our group were ushered into the extraordinary palace. The hallways were cavernous, with walls that had exquisite artwork, shining jewels, or what looked like gold sprinkled on them. My sister's mothers had been separated from our group, and we were led up a spiraling staircase. David and Lex remained on the lawn with Obi. I walked beside Karen, who was silently weeping. Anastasia was on her other side, directing her down the various hallways. I wanted to comfort my sister, but didn't know how. At least I had the knowledge that Mom was alive. Granted, she was the captive of a Janton who happened to be the father of her baby, but at least she was alive. Meg had been ruthlessly killed in front of her daughter. I didn't think that someone could actually recover from something so horrible. Once again, I found the energy to mentally berate myself. I had the power to change my father's mind and didn't use it. Why? That was because despite my hatred for him, I was still conditioned to obey. How many people would have to die before I mustered up the courage to intervene? How many lives had to be ruined until I found the strength to challenge the man? Something within me was broken, and I knew it. You can't be serious, Anastasia complained when we were led down a spiraling staircase. The further down we walked, the colder it became. I wasn't shocked to see that our accommodations lacked the lavish fixings of the upper floors. The walls were a dull gray, and there was only one door in sight. One of Father's guards opened the door and gestured. Your quarters? he announced. We filed in, no one uttering a single complaint. Father trained us well. As soon as the door closed, Karen collapsed on the floor and began shrieking, her mental anguish too much to handle. Anastasia knelt beside her and wrapped her arms around her. Lena's dark eyes landed on me. Aren't you going to put that girl out of her misery? She asked. So Lena had knowledge of what I could do. I eyed Karen and slipped into her mind, her pain nearly shredding my soul. Sleep, I mentally whispered to her, and she fell asleep. All was shockingly quiet, which gave me the opportunity to orient to the room. Seven full-size beds rested in a row, separated by three drawer dressers. I spotted a large walk-in closet that had all of our clothes hanging in it. The beds have been chosen for us, Nina said, pulling open the first drawer and fishing out a pair of granny underwear. Molly chuckled, which made Amy scowl. That would be mine. I sewed them, Amy defended before plopping in the first bed. Nina opened the second drawer and pulled out a red thong, Judging by the fact that none of us conscious sisters claimed the sexy underwear, the bed obviously belonged to Karen. Anastasia lifted Karen with her telekinesis and dropped her onto the bed. We repeated the process until everyone found their beds. I was in the last bed, right beside Lena, who looked more amused than anything else. 
You knew that this was going to happen, I mentally accused Lena. She nodded and shrugged. There is a kitchen in here, Amy said as she opened one of the doors. It's stocked with food. Register rags, Lena said. Don't you all wish that Jade were here? She taught me how to cook. After someone helps me get Karen into her nightgown, I can cook dinner, Nina offered. Anastasia sighed and assisted Nina with Karen. Molly was the first to strip out of her gown. That one wasn't shy about being naked in front of everyone. I supposed that we were family. The door flew open and a blonde woman ran in and tossed a knife at Molly's back. I let out a scream as the knife slammed into Molly. Everyone stared as the nightgown she had just put on shimmered and the knife fell to the ground. Molly quickly snatched up the weapon, but before she could throw it, Lena spoke. Don't throw away a useful weapon, Molly, Lena said. Then she eyed the blonde. What, did Leah send you? You need to learn your places, the blonde hissed. Anastasia, can you do me a favor? Lena inquired as she got to her feet. I guess. What do you need me to do? Anastasia asked, her eyes wide. I need you to hold her still. Lena directed. Anastasia grinned and restrained the blonde with her telekinesis. Lena walked over to Molly and gestured. Molly, I think our lovely older sister needs a haircut, Lena purred. Molly scowled and approached the woman, whose eyes were wide with shock. Molly quickly hacked at the woman's ponytail with the knife and managed to cut it off her head. Then she wrapped the cut-off ponytail around the woman's neck and tied it like a bow. Gwen, compel her. Make her run through the palace butt naked, Lena ordered. I focused on the woman and implanted the thought in her mind. When I was finished, I nodded at Anastasia, and Molly's would-be assassin ran from the room. Anastasia gestured to the door, and it slammed shut. Ladies, we did something that Father tried to get us not to do. We worked together. Forget about the stupid favorites and reject the hierarchy. We're all captives here. We can survive if we play our cards right. What do you mean by that? Molly asked. I mean that we've got to stop fighting amongst ourselves, Lena lectured. It's the seven of us versus the others who will be auctioned off. No matter how Dad dresses it up, it is an auction. He's in debt, and this tedious event will bring him a lot of money. Great, now we're horses, Amy hissed. Men will pay for us? Nina asked as she walked toward the kitchen. Yes, Lena said. He does this crap every year. I think he's actually going to go back next year and father more children. The horror made the power inside me want to lash out. Earth was my home, and the earthlings needed to be protected from the depraved lord. How do we guarantee that we get good men? Anastasia asked. Lena grinned in my direction. Well, Anastasia, we have a secret weapon. Our dear Gwen could mentally control who bids on us, Lena pointed out. And how would I know who a good man was? I asked. The day before the auction, Father invites the hopefuls to the palace. Of course, he charges each one for what's called an interview. He meets with them all, then decides who gets to sit in the bidding pit. And you want me to sneak into the event and read a bunch of minds? I inquired, unease filling my gut. What? You're still loyal to Daddy Dearest? Lena taunted. No, not since he cut my stepfather's head off and left it for my mother to find, I admitted. I was just doing what I had to. I thought that if I obeyed, I'd keep my mother alive. Lord Perk didn't really do anything mean to me, but I don't know. He was probably nicer to me because of my telekinesis, Anastasia said. That evil bastard tricked your mother into sex, got her knocked up, then made her barren once you were born, Molly snapped. That was horrible. Didn't you ever wonder if your mother wanted any more children? No, Anastasia softly said. My mother wanted more children, I added. It killed her that she couldn't have children with Max. If you can compel people, why not tell the evil lord to stop breathing? Molly wondered. Because he told me that he could tell if I used my gift on him, and that Mom would be punished. I responded. And I hope you guys know, if he dies, that means that Obi owns us. He resents us, so what do you think would happen to us? Amy challenged. 
Lena shrugged. If we don't stay here long enough, it might not matter, she said. Now let's get some food in us. Gwen, Anastasia, Karen, and I have a lot of planning to do. Karen? I said, unsure of the choice. She knows the most about our father, Gwen. It would be suicide to do this without her. I supposed I could always compel Karen if she didn't cooperate. But after the light show that I displayed in the flyer, I doubted that she would cross me. Besides, our father murdered her mother. Our father made her mother believe that she was someone special. When she bought into the hype, he punished her for it. Chapter 27 Jade, Naretha, The Rima Estate A high-pitched scream pulled me from my daydream. Somehow, Lord Larshak found a way to trade one biography for another. I had been reading the dry story of an inconsequential rule when I had dozed off. Help me! The female voice screamed. Please! The plea caused me to jump to my feet. I dashed toward the door, my adrenaline making me move at a surprising speed. I wrapped my hand around the knob and twisted. It was locked. Please! The pleading, shrill voice filled me with desperation. What was happening? A memory of Hope's screams flashed in my mind. She had been horrified to discover that she was being married off to a middle-aged man. This stranger's screams seemed more panicked, like danger was imminent for her. I twisted the knob again, worried that someone was assaulting her. My temperature rose as the knob began to glow. I felt a tingle in the back of my neck. Then the door unlocked, the click-making relief flow through me. I opened the door and ran barefoot out of my cottage and saw the danger. A man in a silver uniform was on top of a thrashing body. His knees were on either side of her hips, and his hands were plunged into the neckline of her dress. Shut up! The man yelled in the Nerth language. Once you're no longer pure, Lord Rima will give you to me. My gut twisted at his words. Without thinking, I tossed myself on the guard, knocking him off the screaming woman. He was stunned, which made it easy for me to begin raining desperate punches down on his face. I heard heavy footsteps in the distance as the woman that had been attacked was now sobbing. Her pain fueled me on, strength filling each blow. What's this? A cool voice demanded. That snapped me out of it. I quickly got off the guard and peered down at him. Both eyes were black, and he sported a bloody nose and split lip. I was horrified to see his blood spattered on my blue day dress. I glanced up at the pudgy guard that had escorted me to the cottage on my first day in the harem. He... he was trying to... he was hurting her, I explained in Nerth. He said that if he made her impure, then Lord Rima would give her to him. And how did you get out of your room? Another voice demanded. The pudgy guard stepped aside to reveal a stunning woman with ice-blonde hair, pale skin, and crystal blue eyes. She wore a tight red gown with a plunging neckline. I was somewhat surprised that the gown wasn't saturated with jewels. Perhaps this lady wasn't spending her fortune on frivolous clothing. I don't know. The back of my neck tingled, and then the doorknob got warm, I replied. The woman scowled at me. Your father said that you didn't have the aptitude to access the Hindral crystal, the woman said, her accusing tone taking me back. My father didn't properly evaluate me. The operation to implant my Hindral crystal and tracker took a toll on my body. I was asleep for days and... The woman held up a hand, as if uninterested in the explanation. Gabar, rise the female ordered. The guard that I battered slowly got to his feet, his eyes shooting daggers at me. The woman is lying. I was having a meaningful conversation with Selly, and she attacked me, Gabar argued. Ask the lady. Selly got to her feet, her shaking hands holding together her gown. Her black hair was in disarray, her arms sporting the beginnings of what I knew were going to be horrible bruising. Her eyes were watering, and I could see the fear on her face. My lady, this woman just came out of nowhere. She attacked Gabar. Selly lied. Was this woman afraid of Gabar? Why? He was an insubordinate guard, someone that would surely be punished for damaging the merchandise. Fifty lashes, the woman said. Gabar, you know the rules. You are never to interact with my husband's harem. Tuscan, take him away, Lady Rima ordered. Tuscan, the pudgy guard, delivered a swift blow to Gabar's head and slung the man over his shoulder as if he were a sack of potatoes. He rushed off, leaving the lady and me alone. 
Sally, I don't like being lied to, the lady said. I was afraid, Lady Tamra. Please, I didn't know what to do, Sally cried. You are more afraid of a commoner than me? Lady Tamra asked, agitation on her face. How insulting. You'll have thirty seconds of punishment for that. Go back into your cottage. Sally quickly ran into the cottage beside mine and shut the door. I was thinking that Lady Tamra was going to commend me for my work. After all, I rescued one of her pawns from being deflowered. I hoped that she would barter with me. More books. In thanks for saving Sally's life. But then her eyes grew hard. Jade. What you did was foolish. You're valuable. Gabar is a loose cannon. Someone that can't be trusted. After his fifty lashes, we will terminate his contract. But you were foolish for trying to engage him. What if he snapped your neck? I assumed that the question was rhetorical, so I didn't speak. What if he bashed your head into the ground? You're female. A fragile creature that needs protecting. You're no one's protector. I didn't want to school the lady. She wouldn't believe that women could be in the military and become police officers where I came from. I didn't want to tell her that there was no way that I could sit back and listen to the assault of another woman. Instead, I stared into her hard eyes. That's why you will receive a one minute and twenty second punishment. I'm not doing it to be cruel. I'm doing it to condition you. You are not to risk your life for others. Our world needs as many women as possible. What was I supposed to do? I demanded unable to hold the exasperation in. Is there some kind of panic button I can press when someone is in danger? On Earth, you could call the authorities if your neighbors are in danger. Do you have something like that on Naretha? I was surprised when Lady Tamra pulled me into a warm embrace. I was stiff for a moment, but, but returned the hug, not wanting to offend her. Who knew? Maybe she would make me spend more time in that horrid punishing light. She pulled away from me and kissed my cheek. You're kind-hearted, a quality that is perfect for mothering, but horrible in your circumstances. I will speak on this matter with my husband. As our harem grows, we may need some sort of device that could alert the guards when you're in trouble, Lady Tamra agreed. In the future, I will place married guards on duty in case Gabar decides to come back to finish what he started with Selly. I don't understand something, I said, now that I had a talkative lady with me. And what's that? Why does someone's purity matter? I wondered. Because Narethian women can rarely have two pregnancies, she explained. So Gabar was hoping that Selly became pregnant from his violation. What a creep! I was glad that I pummeled his face. I thought that the lashings and a firing weren't enough of a punishment. It was obvious that Gabar was a predator who would target an unsuspecting woman. Now go into your cottage for your punishment. I reluctantly entered my cottage. As soon as I closed the door, a beam fell from the ceiling and slammed into me. Pain shot through all of my senses, making my mouth open in a scream. I forced myself to focus through the agony. This will be over in seventy seconds, I thought. I forced myself to count down, reminding myself that it wasn't real pain. I would have no scars from the assault. It's not real. It's not real. It's not real. I felt a tingle in the back of my neck, then the pain faded. I blinked, surprised that there were thirty more seconds to the punishment. On instinct, I continued screaming until the beam of light vanished. I had no idea why the punishment had stopped hurting, but I wasn't going to give Lady Tamra a reason to restart the torture. I took a shower and changed into a nightgown. By the time I went into the kitchen, I discovered that more of my lasagna had been eaten. Lord Larshak had been here. I quickly rushed to my bed and discovered that he had switched the boring biography for another one. I hadn't finished the book, but was relieved that I didn't have to. I was disappointed that he hadn't made contact with me, but figured that maybe I was too insignificant for him to bother with. Chapter 28 Gwen, Naratha, The Perk Estate Gwen, wake up! A voice boomed in my mind. I sat up, my head spinning from my quick movements. I blinked a few times to clear the sleep from my eyes. Then I glanced around the quarters that I shared with six other women. It was early, but not insanely so. I slipped out of bed and walked toward the closet. I'm awake, I mentally told my father. Great. Where is the choker I gave you? He asked. 
I changed into a green dress and fished the choker out of my underwear drawer. I slipped it on, the jewelry making me feel as though I had a vice around my neck. Or maybe it was the fact that I needed to hold up my end of the bargain. Lena needed me to discover when the auction was going to take place. Could I just question Lady Valera? That was the simple thing to do. Hopefully I wouldn't have to go sifting in her mind. I tiptoed into the bathroom and brushed my teeth and washed my face. Then I slipped on my shoes and entered the hallway. Where am I going? I mentally inquired. Head to the entrance that you entered the palace from, he instructed. I nodded before realizing that my father couldn't see the gesture. Okay, I mentally responded, before forcing my legs down the long hallway and up the multiple flights of stairs. There was a cleaning robot standing at my destination. It started moving across the foyer and toward the opposite hallway. Am I supposed to follow the cleaning bot? I mentally asked my father. Yes, he answered. Okay, then. I adjusted the choker around my neck before following the cleaning bot down long, winding hallways, all dressed in either gold or valuable gemstones. Why father hadn't stripped the palace of all of the gems and sold them was beyond me. Then again, why sell valuables when he could just take advantage of the Narathian's need for women? Rolling my eyes in disgust, I allowed the bot to lead me up a ramp that led to imposing oak doors. One of them opened, and the bot led me into a spacious sitting area complete with a mahogany table for two. Lady Valera sat at the table, nursing a teacup. The minute she spotted me, a grin stretched across her beautiful face, which was surprising enough. Lady Valera and I had an understanding, sure, but she never went out of her way to show me any kind of warm welcome. Good morning, Lady Valera. Is my father here? I wondered. The scowl she tossed at me made my steps falter. Had I said something wrong? I I'm sorry, Lady Valera. Did I offend you? No. It's the thought of that man with his favorite that's angering me. Now let's stop using that heinous English. Sit. Have some tea. It made sense, how knowing that her husband was sleeping with a woman that he had loved for years would infuriate her. I should have been more careful with my words. Sorry, I said in nerth before joining her at the table. To my surprise and confusion, Lady Valera stood and walked over to the tea trolley. She selected a black teacup and prepared my tea just how I liked it, with a cube of sugar. Shouldn't I serve you? Not this time, Lady Valera graciously said, though it was kind of odd to me. She seemed too friendly. But I figured that maybe she was looking for an ally, someone that she could commiserate with, so I let it go. Thank you, I said, making eye contact with the woman. As soon as Lady Valera returned to her seat, she gestured to the cup. Drink she urged. I usually wait until the tea is cold, I admitted. So what are my duties going to be? Well, you'll be expected to be my assistant, Lady Valera replied. It was strange how that was all Lady Valera could explain. I had no freaking clue what was wrong with the situation. I glanced at Lady Valera and tried to probe at her mind, but it was like she had a wall up. The surprise must have showed on my face, because Lady Valera sighed. Gwen, you have greatly disappointed my husband and me, she purred. How so? I asked, my heart racing. Did she know about Lena's plans? How had Lady Valera shut her mind off from me? What would the punishment be? Gwen, you're one naive girl. You truly don't believe that we don't have the punishment room monitored? Oh, honey, what foolish thinking! And to think that you didn't go to your father as soon as you realized that you had another gift? But no, you kept it to yourself. That means that you shall have it taken away, my evil stepmother said, which gave me chills. What do you mean? I asked. The tea is an anesthetic. You can either drink it or have your crystal removed while you're awake. It's up to you, she said. No! No gift meant that I couldn't help with the plan to take down my father. It meant that I was helpless and could never go to Janton to find my mother. She's going to beg you to change your mind, Leah said as she stepped into the room. Before you try to use compulsion on us, just know I'm stronger than you, Leah warned. I didn't see that I had much of a choice in this matter. Even if I could use my light, it wouldn't get me out of the situation. So with shaky hands, I lifted the teacup and brought it to my lips. 
As soon as I finished drinking, a stabbing pain shot through my back. I began screaming as the pain climbed up my spine and pounded into my skull. Lady Valera grinned. I lied. The tea is breaking down the hydral crystal as we speak. That's why you're in so much pain. Eventually, you'll just crap out the remains. Her words didn't even make me angry, because the utter agony was slamming into me. I shook and screamed, and tears began running down my face. Then I realized that I was being restrained by something. It was probably someone's telekinesis, but I didn't care. The pain was so intense, I just wanted to escape. I pleaded for a reprieve. Thank you, Leah. I wouldn't want her messing up the furniture. Lady Valera shouted. The lady's taunting words pissed me off so much that I felt my light bubble to the surface. The pain lessened for just a moment, but then it intensified again. What the hell is happening to you? A voice mentally asked in Nerth. Pain. Breaking down the hydral crystal. I sent out. I had no idea whose mind I was in, but it felt peaceful, so I stayed there. The pain began to lessen as I allowed this stranger's mind to invade my senses. I'm Christian, by the way. I thought you should know before you made a home in my mind. Gwen, I responded. I'm going to lose this power soon. You're the last person I'm going to talk to. You mean your stolen powers? Christian asked. I didn't steal anything. When I was a baby, Lord Perk implanted a tracker and a hydral crystal in me. I didn't have a choice. I had no idea why I wanted to convince an absolute stranger of my innocence, but I'd be damned if I was going to be responsible for thieving work that my sperm donor put me through. You don't know where the crystals come from? The bones of the Najorian, Christian responded. What do you mean? I asked, confused. Sleep, Gwen. No need to torture yourself by staying awake, he insisted. Your mind is safe, I pleaded, though I really couldn't read any of his thoughts. I could only sense warmth. Thanks. Most people say that my mind is filthy. But I guess the purity of the mind is... No, scratch that. I guess that saying needs too much reconfiguring if I'm using it to make it fit. You're going to be safe, my dear Gwen. You just have to trust me, Christian said. I'm scared, I told him. Without my gifts, I'm going to be powerless. You're plenty strong without stolen magic, he told me. I'm weak even with magic, I confessed. Most of this is my fault. I played into my father's hands. I obeyed his every command. I helped kidnap Jade when I could have altered everyone's memories to make them think that Jade was dead. But I didn't do that. Why? Christian questioned. Because I was trying to save my mother, I replied. Go to sleep, Gwen. I'll see you soon. Before I could even protest, I was out like a light. Chapter 29. Jade. Naretha. The Rima Estate. I was finished with the autobiography of yet another megalomaniac who ruled Naretha. The book was a bit dry, but I would have read a manual by that point. Boredom was beginning to drive me wild, and I hated to admit that I was actually longing for the noble, considering that my last human contact had been with Lady Tamra, who had punished me for having a heart. I forced myself to shove the light punishment from my mind. Instead, I went to the kitchen and decided to make shepherd's pie. Well, it was a Narethian version of it. I had to substitute a few things. After that was finished, I decided to bake chocolate chip cookies again. As I prepared the dough, I thought of Jane, who had sat at the kitchen table watching me make a dessert for her bitter sister-in-law. I had to stop rolling the dough, the memory so overwhelming. I needed a distraction, and the boring biography wasn't going to cut it. As soon as the shepherd's pie and cookies were finished, the door flew open. To my relief and annoyance, Lord Larshak barged into the cabin. He closed the door and sniffed appreciatively. Dinner was some gooey piece of crap that's supposed to be healthy, he complained. Did you learn anything from the biography? he questioned. My eyes widened in surprise. Why have you been leaving me books? I asked. Did you learn anything about our society? he persisted. Women never really had any freedom, I said, disappointed, but it wasn't nearly as bad as it is now. That's all you can focus on? Lord Larshak demanded. Of course. What else am I supposed to focus on? I'm trapped in the cottage. Speaking of being trapped, have you met the other women? I wondered. I've only met one woman, Ella. She will be married off pretty soon, I'm sure of it, 
he said. After she leaves, the focus will turn to you, since you are new. That means you should pay attention to the material I give you. I had partly responded with my opinion to annoy him and to point out that women shouldn't be collected and hidden away like glass china. Instead of pointing that out, I decided to reward his kindness. Would you like some shepherd's pie? I asked. He frowned as if he hadn't heard of the dish before. Was that an insult? Lord Larshak asked. No, it's a dish from Earth, I corrected. He nodded, the interest making me chuckle. I rushed into the kitchen, grabbing two plates from the cabinet, and served up the food. I gave him a plate along with silverware. With my food in hand, I sat down on the bed and Lord Larshak plopped down beside me. His proximity made me uncomfortable, but I ignored the awkward feeling in my gut and began eating. The pie was a bit salty, but delicious. He watched me eat for a moment before digging in. The delight transformed his face, making joy fill my chest. When he wasn't scowling, he was handsome. This is phenomenal, Lord Larshak declared. What's your first name? I wondered. My given name? Lord Larshak asked, confused. Yes, what is it? I insisted. Why would you like to know, Jade? He asked. Goodness, could this man ever answer any of my questions? Because I'm curious, I responded before continuing to eat. Tell me something that you learned from one of the biographies that I lent you, then I'll answer you, he bargained. I learned that Narethian leaders have obviously been building their military in hopes of invading other planets. I also learned that only the Narethians rule, but there are pockets of Jantons and Ajori living in the wilderness, I said. Right, the savage tribes, Lord Larshak said. Do you think that you're better than them? I asked, disgust coating my tone. It isn't a matter of me being better than them. They live off the land and refuse to conform to Narethian society. Maybe if they do, their women would be taken away from them, I accused. Lord Larshak paused and considered my statement. I wanted to smirk when he hesitantly nodded. I never thought about it that way, he admitted. Zemeyer. Zemeyer? What's that? Another tribe? I asked, bemused. Zemeyer is my name, Lord Larshak impatiently said. Don't ever call me by it. It will be seen as an insult. I nodded, recalling that a commoner had been beheaded for making the same mistake. The nobles in Naretha were extremely strict. What is your home like? I wondered. I sometimes have a hard time remembering, since I spend so much time touring the galaxies, he replied. Wow, you must have seen a lot, I replied, amazed at the thought. Just remember, Jade, just because I've seen a lot, it doesn't mean that it was pleasant, he cautioned. My chest ached at the thought that he had seen unspeakable violence. Oh, I'm sorry. You don't know me well, but I'm a good listener. If you ever need to talk, you can talk to me, well, if you have no one. Which is stupid, because a lord has plenty of friends to talk to. Though I imagine that a lord has shady friends that may stab them in the back later. I'm not like that. I believe that you receive what you put into the universe. Like, if you put in nothing but negativity, you'll get it in return, I rambled. Zemeyer let out a sigh. If I have no one to talk to, I can come to you? He inquired, seeming confused. I didn't mean it quite like that. I meant I don't want you to assume that you have no one to talk to, but I wanted to let you know that I'm here for you, I explained. Zemeyer nodded and abruptly got to his feet. Didn't you have a sweet treat in the kitchen? He asked me. Yes, I made chocolate chip cookies. He scarfed down the rest of his shepherd's pie and went into the kitchen. I wanted to laugh when he came in with a small plate stacked with cookies. You might get a stomachache if you eat too many sweets, I warned. I once ate an entire cake by myself, Zemeyer boasted. I shook my head and allowed the man to eat nine cookies. I have to go. He quickly went into the kitchen and discarded his empty plate. I was disappointed when he left me alone in my cottage. Chapter 30 Sheena the Kigor Port. We stood near the bank of glass elevators, my heart beating on overtime. Winston opted for what was known as a wireless refuel, in case we needed to leave in a hurry. Derek eyed me, his concern palpable. He obviously desired to inform the king of what he'd learned, but hadn't wanted to abandon us. 
I wore a long-sleeved t-shirt and jeans, and a knife was tucked into my boot. Amber's magnificent silver sword was secured in a scabbard hanging from her hip, and Angelo had the same equipment, though his sword was cobalt blue. Derek opted for throwing knives that he had stashed in various hiding spots on his body. Mira and Winston weren't well-versed in combat, so they had stun guns hidden in ankle holsters. That had been Amber's idea, since she hadn't wanted them accidentally shooting a member of our group. I needed to use my instincts to find Rose, although I highly doubted that I was capable of honing my intuition to find specific things. But since Mira ran into difficulties hacking into the spaceport's security system, my friends were counting on me. Let's check by a bathroom, I suggested. A bathroom? Amber asked in an anxious tone. Her rescuing the humans stuck in the unusual creatures display hinged on us finding Rose. Sounds like a good idea, Derek said, before grabbing my hand. I knew the drill. He had to show the scary giants that I belonged to him. Four laughing giants strolled out of one of the glass elevators, their laughter only increasing when they spotted us. Look at the Najurian scum, the giant with his head shaved on one side commented. He spoke Janton, so I was the only one who understood him. I kept my expression neutral as my eyes gravitated to an elevator in the center of the pack. I stepped forward, my group following behind me. Winston quickly waved his hand in front of the sensor that was there in place of a call button. The door flew open, and the six of us piled in. As soon as the door closed, I gestured to the number nine. Winston waved a finger over the number, and the elevator went downward. For extra good luck, I focused on Rose and the urgency to find her. Warmth brushed my chest, and I felt a knowing of where she was going to be. My fingers and toes tingled when the lift opened. The smell of sewage smacked me in the nose. I had to fight the urge to gag. We filed out into the hallway, which was wide and had off-white walls that had some blood spatter. Crap. Had Rose already been offed? If I was too late, Amber would never forgive anyone in this group. Rose was the last connection that she had to her father. No, Rose wasn't dead. She was a knight, which meant that she knew how to play her hand. I allowed the instincts that had always annoyed me to decide my next step. Derek and I turned right and hustled down the mostly empty hallway. It was too quiet. My ears were straining, distrustful of the silence. Watching the Janton taught me that they were warriors who oftentimes had skirmishes that seemed to end in broken bones or, on some occasions, death. This deserted floor either was long forgotten or held in... Ambush! Attack! I screeched as the wall to my right vanished and a Janton ran at Derek. My soulmate quickly knocked me to the side and teleported behind the man and wrapped himself around the man's back. I pulled out my blade and aimed low, slicing the giant's ankle. I heard the whistle of steel and realized that the wall to the left disappeared. Five giants charged our group, Angelo meeting them head on. He used his cobalt sword to slice at the enemies, sometimes managing to sever a limb or appendage from someone. Amber fought the second Janton that had joined the fight. There must have been a hallway on the other side of the wall. I couldn't say why. I heard a scream and spotted Mira in the arms of one of the hostile aliens. She wiggled, but obviously couldn't teleport away from him. For one split second, I relished the death of the female that had dared try to take what wasn't hers. But then I shook my head, realizing that Mira had gone on this particular mission for the greater good. She didn't deserve what was happening to her. I tapped into the warmth that I felt and tossed my arm out. A sharp pain filled my head, and for a second, my vision tunneled. But then I glanced at the giant, or what was left of him. Mira was standing in a pile of ashes. Amber leaped in the air beheading the giant that was going to charge me, probably wanting to avenge the friend that I turned to ashes. I glanced around and saw that Derek was bruised, and he had a black eye, but he was whole. Winston stunned the last Janton standing, then Angelo beheaded him. I glanced down at my hands that were no longer glowing with utter befuddlement. Amber ran over to me, her clothing splattered with her enemy's blood. She eyed me warily. That was your first kill. How do you feel? Amber cautiously asked. Cold, I said with honesty. What had occurred wasn't natural. I kept replaying the moment in my head. What happened? Derek, whose clothes were just as bloodstained, eyed me with gratitude. It was obvious that although he'd found his soulmate, he didn't want Mira dead. I nodded. What now? 
Winston said as he glanced down at the blood spatter on his shirt with distaste. We go that way, Mira said. I can hear Rose's thoughts. That other group was supposed to stop her if she escaped, she explained as she inspected her stun gun. I gripped my knife tightly, hoping that I wouldn't have to use the strange power again. Angelo and Mira took the lead, Derek and I walking behind them. Amber and Winston took the rear, which gave me comfort. Amber wouldn't let anything happen to me. They are there, Mira said, pointing to the wall in front of us. Amber pushed forward and lifted a hand. Moments later, she blew a section of the wall apart, creating a doorway big enough for us to walk through two at a time. She ran in, Angelo and Mira following close behind her. Winston, Derek, and I were the last of our group to enter the room. We were in a wide room that had only a bar two times the height of what I was used to seeing. A woman, who was curled up on the table, was dressed in a ratty t-shirt and threadbare jeans. There was a pile of ashes by the bar, which gave me an idea of what happened. There were five Janton leaning against the wall. Rose was lying on the ground in front of them, her wrists and ankles tied. I eyed Amber, who stared at the Janton males with animosity. I stepped forward, Derek staying close to my side. I sized up the tallest alien, the one with the long blonde hair, and spoke. Isn't it dishonorable to tie up your enemy? I questioned. The blonde rolled his eyes. There is no honor in being a fool, he sneered. Why is she tied up? I persisted, my eyes on his chest. Could I conjure that strange light again? Don't, Derek mentally told me. Keep stalling. Their minds are tough to sift through. Since I don't speak Janton, I have to decipher the images that I'm seeing. Rose heard the woman on the table screaming, so she killed the man that was trying to experiment on her. The man that she killed is important to them. I don't know how, though. You speak our tongue well, Nerethian. The blonde giant taunted, which made me scowl. So, you have no honor, then? I asked, waiting to see if more Jantons came out of the woodwork. The blonde must have figured out my intent, because he leapt forward, his fist aimed at Derek. Derek ducked, then swiveled to the side, while I rolled and came up on my feet, and delivered a jab to the side of another giant. He screeched and attempted to lunge for me, but I was already running past him, my intent on clearing the action. I made it to an area where I had a perfect view of the skirmish. Derek was battling with his blades and his fists. Mira shot an alien with a stun gun, and he toppled to the ground. Angelo made short work of the last two giants, beheading them with his blade before they could see what happened. Chapter 31 Sheena, the Kigor Port Angelo, how many people can you teleport at a time? I asked, as soon as the last Janton died. We've got to get to the unusual creatures display, Amber insisted. I was exhausted. Using that strange light took something out of me. The last thing that I wanted to do was hang around the dreaded place. I thought of my mother and what she would have told me. You are a caster, a protector of all. But what made me the protector of all? I hadn't chosen that fate and most definitely didn't want to bear this responsibility. In truth, I was too selfish to put the needs of strangers before myself. But I knew that Amber would never be able to walk away until every human was rescued. I hope we don't have to fight any more Janton, Winston said as he stumbled over to me. He clearly had a few bumps and bruises. I felt weary. Let me get Rose, Winston, and the woman onto the ship. I'll have to secure them in case Rose attempts to steal Winston's ship, Angelo said. Amber didn't look happy about leaving Winston alone, but she had no choice. She was the muscle in the group. Okay, Amber agreed. Take the woman and Rose first. Angelo scooped up the woman in one arm, and Winston lifted a bound rose into his arms. Winston walked over to Angelo and held out his hand. Angelo took it and teleported away. Derek wrapped a strong arm around me. Maybe you should also stay on the ship. You look really tired, he said. Amber gave me a high five and grinned. You did well, Oracle, she complimented. I guess, I replied, without Amber's enthusiasm. But your soulmate is right. You look like you're about to drop, Amber said. No, I protested. 
If I go, you'll have to, and that's not going to work. Fine, Derek grumbled as Mira joined us. She had a busted lip and bruises around her neck. I think I'll keep Winston company. I'm not much of a fighter, she said as Angelo returned. Mira took Angelo's hand and she smiled at him and nodded. He must have understood her, because they vanished. Moments later, Angelo returned and eyed our group. This is an in-and-out mission, Angelo declared. I'll teleport us to the unusual creatures exhibit, and then we leave. Okay, I agreed. He reached out to me and I took hold of his left hand, while Amber snatched Angelo's right. To my surprise, Derek then took my hand. Wait a second, I said, my eyes studying Derek. Angelo, why did Mira and Winston need you to teleport them away? I wondered, and Amber nodded as if she were curious about the same thing. Angelo stared at Derek, who sighed. There is Blictar in the foundation of this building. It affects our teleportation skills. Blictar is a black mineral that counteracts the power of most Najorians. Derek explained. Most? I demanded. Angelo isn't allergic to Blictar. His Blictar-resistant meds were a placebo. I was never to reveal that to him. It is classified information. Fury flashed in Angelo's eyes, his face twisted in anger. So I'm not just paint boy. I'm immune to Blictar, which must count for something, Angelo fired back. I'm not as useless as the king thought. You aren't, Derek grudgingly admitted. Now, can we leave? I could tell by his tight jaw that Derek wasn't excited that Angelo could still teleport. Sighing, Angelo closed his eyes, which caused the burning sensation to amplify. When the discomfort ended, we were standing in front of a clear cube. My heart sank when I saw that humans were truly being kept in display cases, like they were something to marvel at. Nice work! Amber cheered as she eyed the four cubes in the row, each holding a human. Derek eyed the foreign numbers, then glanced at me with an arched brow. Each of them are 900 credits, I said, and he nodded. Derek quickly went to the first cube, which held a male who had to be 45. He was thin, with brown skin, a thick beard, and a frown. When Derek brushed his finger against the sensor, the cube turned white. Then it opened. Can you walk? Derek asked in English. No. They broke my legs he replied. Angelo stepped forward, his intent to carry the man, but I held up a hand. You can't let them see what you can do until the last possible moment, I warned. Angelo scooped the man up and darted away. Derek hovered a finger over a cube that held a man who looked like he was in his mid-thirties. His face was swollen, and a few of his fingers on one hand were twisted at an odd angle. When the cube opened, the man slowly got to his feet. I shoved away from Derek and eyed him. Don't attack, I said in English. We're trying to buy you out of here. He glared at me, but nodded. He stepped out of the cube, his body shaking. Derek wrapped an arm around his shoulder to offer support. The third cube held a short woman with inky black hair and golden brown skin. Derek released his hold on the guy with the broken fingers so that he could purchase her. As soon as the cube opened, she stood and hesitantly walked out of her prison cell. Did you see a woman with red hair, freckles, a scar on her chin? She demanded. The giants took her an hour ago. She mouthed off to one of our handlers, she urgently explained. She's on our ship, Derek said, after glancing at the woman's forehead. Who are you people? The woman demanded. We don't have time for this, Amber said as she gestured to the last cube in the row, which held a frightened-looking woman with long brown hair. Can either of you run? Derek asked as Angelo jogged up to us. No, we have been stuck here for months, the man with the broken fingers explained. We'll help you, Amber promised as an eight-foot-tall Janton with long brown hair strolled over to the last cage. Crap, I said, darting over to it, Amber on my heels, her hand glowing. Before he could touch the cube, I jabbed my blade into his side. The man's eyes landed on me and he raised a meaty fist. Amber wrapped her glowing magic around it, holding him still. Derek, she said, sweat on her forehead. I was relieved when Derek took the place of the man and purchased the last human. As soon as the tall, thin woman was out of her cube, 
Derek tossed the woman over his shoulder. You'll pay for this, the giant warned. You lost, I said in Janton. Just forget about it. The man snarled. I need a housekeeper for my pregnant wife. She will have a good life with me, the man promised. The kindness in his eyes made me hesitant to watch him die. He seemed like a normal father. Take your pick of the other creatures. These people are going home. I replied in Janton, and he nodded at Amber, who released her grip. He rubbed his sore wrist and ruffled Amber's hair. You're a warrior, little one, he said before walking away. Let's get the hell out of here, I insisted, right before an explosion shook the port. It was under attack. Crap! I screamed and quickly ran after the giant. I grabbed his arm and dragged him toward our group. Something told me to take him with us. Quick, I said in Janton. The man followed my lead, and we jogged toward Angelo, who had thankfully begun teleporting our group out of the port. Derek ran to me and arched a brow. We need him, I said in English. Amber grabbed my hand, and Derek latched onto my arm. Angelo returned for us, sweat dripping down his face. He took my hand, and I felt the fire explode in my veins. The next thing I knew, we were back on the ship. Get into a seat! Winston shouted as rumbles filled the air. He didn't have to tell me twice. I sat on the recliner closest to me, the one beside a human woman with long black hair. Thankfully, the man with the broken legs had already been secured in his seat. I had barely gotten my belt buckled when Winston zoomed the ship away from the port. Chapter 32 Gwen, Naretha, The Peirk Estate I felt a warm cloth touch my forehead. My aching eyes slowly opened. It was bright, so I quickly closed them. I tried again, but my eyes failed to stay open for a bit longer. Open your eyes, Gwen. Please, Nina softly begged. I concentrated on keeping my eyes open, which made Nina squeak. Oh, thank goodness! You just got dumped in here two days ago. You've been unresponsive for a week before then, Nina cried. Unresponsive? I croaked out. Don't try to talk, Nina urged. Anastasia, can you please bring me a glass of water? I could barely make out anything in front of me, which utterly sucked, but the fog in my brain was more troubling. What was wrong with me? What did they do to me? I asked in English. I don't know, Nina said. Now I'm going to help you sit up. Okay, I said. Nina placed her arm under my back and I slowly sat up. She pressed a glass to my lips and I drank greedily as someone sat on my bed. I could barely make out Anastasia. Hi, honey. Do you know what happened? She demanded of me. Foggy. I replied when Nina pulled the glass away from me. What do you mean by foggy? Molly asked. It's like I can't think. I explained before draining the glass of water. Nina placed the glass on the dresser beside my bed and smiled at me. What have I missed? I rasped out. Nothing much. Sometimes David comes here to give us updates. We have to participate in some stupid auction that also gives rich people a chance to bet on us, Molly explained. I have no idea why anyone who isn't looking for a bride would go to this thing. I mean, hello, Lord Peirk is money-hungry. He is making us compete against one another and allowing spectators to bet on the matches, Amy added. I made a surprised noise that made Molly scoff. Shocked? I have no idea why you would be, Molly commented. It gets better. The lords bid on the winners, while the commoners bid on the losers, Anastasia interjected, which cleared the fog. Everything rushed back to me and I quickly touched my neck, and discovered that the choker was gone. I was relieved that my position may have been taken from me. It wasn't like I wanted to work with Lady Valera, who was skilled at manipulation. They made me drink some kind of tea that breaks down the Hydral crystal, I revealed. It was horrible, I... I stopped speaking, the horror of suffering the agony of the Hydral crystal being destroyed giving way to a memory. The pain was so bad that I escaped into someone's mind. I... I'm sorry, guys. I can't rig the auction. I don't have my abilities anymore. 
Why? Karen cried. Her voice brought tears to my eyes. The last time I laid eyes on her, she had been asleep. I had to knock her out since the loss of her mother sent her spiraling. As my vision cleared, despair nearly drowned me. I could no longer control any of our futures. This was now a hopeless situation. It's okay, Nina softly said. We'll figure something out. It will all work out. How? Karen demanded. Gwen was our last hope. Karen's words nearly shattered me because the words were true. I had been the only one capable of securing my sisters a happy future. Wait! Nina cheered. We forgot to show you what we realized. Nina jogged to the closet and pulled out a silk jumpsuit and tossed it to Molly, who got to her feet. She stripped out of her nightgown and tossed it on the floor. Amy tisked and quickly picked up the nightgown. Molly, these are valuable. We don't know when we'll get new clothes, she lectured. Molly rolled her eyes and glanced at Anastasia. Well, I'm too lazy to walk, Molly insisted. What? Anastasia asked, baffled. She wants the knife, Amy clarified. Oh, why didn't you just say that? Anastasia wondered. Molly is rude, we all know that, Karen griped, which made Molly shoot Karen a one-fingered salute. Judging by the way Karen smirked, I could tell that it was all in good fun. If only Father could see how his cruelty had bonded the group. Whatever, just get on with this, Amy urged. Molly quickly sliced her palm. Her hand began to glow, and then she raised her palm, and her eyes twinkled. How is that possible? I asked as Molly held her palm up to my face. I saw the blood, but the skin was unbroken. How? I questioned the group. We are thinking that Jade has some kind of enchantment gift, Amy explained. That's impossible! I've never heard of anything like that! I exclaimed. Then again, the strange light that I could wield had also been rare. What if the new batch of crystals gave us powerful gifts? Thinking of the Hindral crystal reminded me of what Christian said. You don't need stolen magic. What did Christian mean by stolen magic? Maybe he meant that my father had snatched a few crystals from the lab. I wouldn't have put it past him. I shoved the conversation with Christian from my mind when I recalled that I didn't have my choker. What happened to my choker? I asked, hoping that the duty had been passed on to someone else. I took it from your neck after you were brought here. Molly answered, which made my stomach twist. So I'm really stuck here for five years, I told myself, wishing that my assumption had been correct. I wished that I hadn't ingratiated myself with my father. Then maybe I wouldn't have been in the position to serve the monster. Why didn't you tell us that you were chosen as lady-in-waiting? Anastasia wondered. Because Dad said that it was our little secret, I responded. By then, my mother was still with us. I'm sorry about that, Karen softly said. I told Mom not to choose, but then she pointed out that if she refused to choose, then one of the other mothers would choose her. I get it, I said. The harem is every woman for herself. I'm not mad at your mother, Karen, and I'm sorry I couldn't stop it. It happened so fast. Before I could do anything, I... A tear trickled down my sister's cheek, and she brushed it away. We have to concentrate on surviving the bidding war. Once we find useful husbands, we could either get the hell off this stupid planet or live happy lives away from father. Gwen, would you like something to eat? Nina asked. Before I could respond to her, the door flew open and Leah barged in. Molly, who still had the knife, hefted it as she stared at our oldest sister. Is there something you want? Molly demanded. I could mentally control you, Molly but I'm not going to waste any energy on you. Molly rolled her eyes and plopped down on the bed beside Karen. You're here for me? I asked, dread making my stomach twist. I am. So hurry up, Leah ordered. Give me a minute, I said. Leah leaned against the wall and crossed her arms. I quickly got out of bed and entered the bathroom. I brushed my teeth and washed my face. I thought that you would want to borrow this. Nina said as she entered the room. I smiled gratefully when she handed me a blue jumpsuit. Thank you, Nina. I really appreciate it, I said. No problem. Be careful. Lady Valera is more dangerous than father. 
I don't want to see you hurt, Gwen, she warned. I'll be careful, Nina. I promise. Nina nodded and left me alone. I quickly changed into the jumpsuit and exited the bathroom. Leah rose a brow, obviously not expecting my choice of outfit. Molly handed me my black flats, and I slipped them on. Where is your choker? Leah demanded. Nina fetched the choker out of her dresser drawer and handed it to me. I took the necklace from my sister and eyed it for a second. When I received this necklace, I had been thrilled to be given the honor. It was funny how a few weeks could change someone's perspective. Just put it on, Leah huffed, and I obeyed the cruel woman. Chapter 33 Gwen, Naratha, The Peirk Estate Leah said nothing as she led me down the hallway. She whistled. At that moment, I envied the woman for the ability she possessed. Now that I couldn't poke inside someone's head, I had to receive information the old-fashioned way. What does Lady Valera want with me? I asked Leah. I'm not her assistant. You are. How am I supposed to know? Leah snapped. Before I could respond, Leah suddenly covered my mouth with her hand. Then, Lex and David materialized from the wall beside me. Before I could make a sound, David grabbed hold of my arm with his other hand and I was propelled through the wall. I blinked in surprise when we ended up in a stairway. Let it go, Vanessa, David whispered. Moments later, his hand was removed from my mouth and Leah's features changed. A short girl with long, dark hair stood in front of me, her smiling face surprising. What's going on? I asked, once the shock faded from my mind. We want to know the same thing, Lex snapped as he glared in my direction. What is that supposed to mean? I cried. So you don't know? Lex wondered. Know what? I asked, confused. The key report was destroyed, Vanessa reported. Because of your abilities, I assumed you would know what happened. Did father do it? Guys, I got my hydral crystal removed. I can't read minds, I informed the group, whose mouths dropped open. You can't be serious, Lex hissed. Dad was that stupid? He was. One of the abilities I used to have destroyed the punishment room, and I didn't tell him. How did you make me think you looked like Leah? I wondered. It was all an illusion, she explained. I was surprised I could hold it for so long. The Kigor port is where most of Lord Peirk's investments are. I doubt he would have destroyed it, I noted, dread making my stomach twist. The women of the harem would suffer for this tragedy. Great, I huffed. How did Lord Peirk react? He locked himself in his office. I haven't been able to do much eavesdropping since the room beside his is Lady Valera's parlor. You know how she feels about us, David explained. So you wanted me to go down there and eavesdrop? I asked my brother. That's when we thought that you had power, Vanessa said, a hopeless expression on her face. She was obviously pissed off, since there was no use for me. I could go into Lady Valera's parlor and ask if she needs me, I suggested. Or maybe you could go back to bed, Christian mentally told me. You're tired. Something must have registered on my face, because David arched a brow. What? David asked. Can you hear me? I mentally asked David. I felt a slight pressure in my head and winced. David's eyes grew wide, and at first, I thought that he'd heard me. But then he gestured to my hands, which were slightly glowing. I glanced up at Vanessa, who grinned. It looks like the doctor is about to lose her head. How do you still have abilities? Vanessa asked. It's innately yours, Christian mentally explained. This power has always been inside of you. How do you know? I mentally questioned Christian. And how am I talking to you? I have the mental gifts that your father stole for you. Listen, Gwen, go down two flights of stairs, Christian instructed. Without hesitation, I ran past my siblings, strength immediately filling my limbs. I ran down the two flights of stairs, then stopped at the landing. Press your palm to the wall. That will be how you can listen. I reached out and pressed my glowing hand to the wall. The gold-studded sheetrock disintegrated, and I quickly pulled my hand back. I peered into a room that had a few plush chairs in a circle. There were multicolored flowers on end tables. 
and a side table holding refreshments. Lady Valera stood by the table, her eyes on a tablet. That was probably why she couldn't see the hole that I made. Valera! Leah called, which made me jerk in surprise. My sister was so confident in her place that she dared to actually call Lady Valera Valera? Why? It's all set, Lady Peterk said. The cleaners will assemble tomorrow. I will have them all compelled into submission. Do you know if Gwen is awake yet? She is. Lex sent me a message. She and David are on the north steps. They have always been close. I can't wait until he leaves for military training. He is no use to us here. The girls haven't been talking about anything interesting. Karen and Molly have become friends. Are you sure that using Meg as the example was the right idea? Karen is intelligent, Leah pointed out. It isn't like I can raise Meg from the dead. Besides, children who are vying for my husband's attention is the least of our worries. I will have to figure out how to charge the hell out of our guests. You will need to convince a few to bid higher. Right, I've got the pit. What about the audience? We'll make them bet on the outcome of the matches. I'm thinking we'll start things out with fencing. Then we'll have an archery contest. The winner will have a starting bid on them, Lady Valera explained. Other than that, I am at a loss as to how to gouge more credits out of the people. And we have to give the gamblers a percentage of the purse, Leah sourly said. Since Gwen is useless, can I sit in the box? You know we can't do that. You're married. I need Gwen to sit there, since she can serve as eye candy. Then, at the end, there can be a surprise bidding for her. After that, I'll name another lady-in-waiting. Maybe Vanessa. Time to go, Gwen. You're becoming too difficult to shield. Christian suddenly announced. I turned to face David, whose eyes were wide with shock. My guess was that he couldn't understand why Lady Valera was so comfortable around Leah. Wasn't she the daughter of father's true love? Maybe Leah was controlling Lady Valera. In any case, I had to get the hell out of there. I gestured to the stairs and bolted up them, followed by David. We reached the landing where I had left Lex and Vanessa, and they were both standing there. I lunged at Lex and punched him in the jaw. He fell to the floor with a thud that made me wince. He has been reporting to Lady Valera, I told my siblings. David slipped a hand in the pocket of Lex's silk suit and pulled out a tablet the size of a playing card. Vanessa's eyes were hard with anger. So he's the rat? Vanessa hissed. I've been trying to sneak out of this hellhole for a week. Every time I get caught. David frowned. Do you think that Obi put him up to this? David wondered. No, Christian told me. I don't think so, I said. Something tells me that Obi isn't close to his parents. If he were, then Lex wouldn't have needed to spy for Lady Valera. What now? David asked, his eyes wide. I shrugged. I don't know. I need to go back to my room before Leah becomes suspicious, I decided. David, I know just the place for our little snitch, Vanessa said with a grin. Wait until you see how our siblings deal with snitches. Why haven't you guys dealt with Leah? I tossed out. Vanessa rolled her eyes. Leah hates Dad as much as the rest of us do. Remember that, Gwen. Vanessa said. I'll return her, David told Vanessa before grabbing my arm. He walked me through the wall and I was back in a familiar hallway. I took a deep breath and prepared myself for the news I had to tell my sisters. Molly would be furious to discover that Leah was constantly checking in on us. I'd have to convince her not to attempt to stab the mind reader in her sleep. Chapter 34 Jade Naretha The Rima Estate Over the next week, new biographies would appear under my pillow. Sometimes I noticed that my leftovers had been pillaged, but I didn't lay eyes on Zemire. I couldn't help but think I had crossed a line by offering to play counselor for him. In truth, all I wanted to do was help. My intentions may have chased away my only ally. As I needed the dough to make pie, I heard my door open. I jumped and spun around. A tall woman with long golden hair and bronzed skin stormed over to me. She sneered at the day dress I wore. Did the prince give that to you? 
the woman demanded. I frowned, unsure of what this stranger was talking about. Prince? What prince? Never mind that. I sewed this dress. You could confirm that with my father, I offered. The woman's eyes narrowed on me. So you're nothing more than a seamstress who is vying to be the prince's concubine? The woman questioned. Look, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, I said, confused. But what prince? Lord Larshak hasn't been coronated yet, but it is understood that he will be the crowned prince of Naretha in a few weeks, she huffed. Don't play smart with me. Oh, Lord Larshak is a prince? Oh, wow. Anyway, I have no interest in being a concubine. He only came in here to eat my food. Apparently, he hates the cook's food. Sometimes he left me books to read, since we sort of have a barter system going. He eats my food, I read a book. I had no idea... Books? The woman, who now looked embarrassed, cried. Zemeyer came in here to give you books? I gestured to my pillow. I hide the biographies under my pillow because I'm not sure if I'm supposed to have them, I explained, my heart pumping. You're a seamstress that likes to read? The woman slowly asked. What kind of universe am I living in? I also like to cook. If you wait 15 minutes, I can bake a mean pie for you, I replied. What's pie? The woman said. It's an earth dish. So, uh... Who are you again? I asked, confused. I was relieved that this stranger was speaking in English, because the language came naturally to me. Right. I'm Anneli Rima, the future princess of Naretha. She bragged. Embarrassment quickly flooded my face, my heart beginning to crack. No wonder why Zemeyer chose to keep me at arm's length. He had a gorgeous fiancé that he didn't want to mess things up with. I felt even lonelier than ever before. Why hadn't Zemeyer bothered telling me that he was a prince? Why allow me to be surprised in that way? Oh, don't be embarrassed. Many people don't know that I'm going to be queen someday. So, let me check under your pillow. The future queen of Naretha strolled over to my bed and lifted the pillow. Oh, the three doomed princes. One of the more depressing books, Anneli commented. Right, because they all die from being poisoned. I agreed, figuring that I might as well go back to my pie. Maybe if she saw that I was busy, she would leave me be. Precisely, Anneli brightly said. Tomorrow we're going on a trip, Jade. Be sure to wear our colors, she said, before storming out. I had a terrible feeling that the trip wasn't going to be a pleasant one. I wasn't surprised when I found the biography missing. It was disappointing, since I had been halfway through it. Anneli would probably take the proof of the prince's indiscretions and show them to his father. Annoyed, I ate my dinner, which was tacos and pie, and decided to do some yoga to pass the time. After I couldn't quite get into the soothing routine, I brushed my teeth and forced myself to fall asleep. A cranky guard woke me up the next day. He informed me that Lady Anneli would retrieve me soon. I quickly showered and dressed in the same silver gown that I had arrived in. Then I twisted my locks into an updo and didn't bother with makeup. I wasn't talented at the feet and had no blemishes, so what was the point? I'd like a gown just like that one, but with jewels, Anneli said as she entered the cottage. Sure, I said. As long as someone provides me with the materials, I can make it for you. The lady laughed. As if I'd actually wear something that you touched. No, my seamstress will make the gown for me she said. What a witch. If she was going to be queen of the country, I felt terrible for the Narathians. Hopefully, I would escape this wretched place before she ascended to the throne. I followed the princess out of the cottage and into the warm air. We made our way to the steps of the platform, where five guards dressed in silver stood. Silver uniforms were waiting for us. I gawked as one of the guards lifted an Ellie into his arms and walked her up the steps. I couldn't suppress the eye roll. I walked up the steps, my calves aching as I reached the top, where two silver flyers were waiting for us. Anneli was led to one flyer, while I was directed to another. Lady Rima, you're going to the same place, one of the guards protested in Nerth. I'm not riding with that piece of trash, 
she responded, and anger filled me. She didn't have to be so rude to the commoners. I was sure that Molly would have decked her if it were her. I headed over to the other flyer and got in. The same quiet guard that had picked me up from my father's spaceship was the one that piloted the transport. Did women drive or fight in the military? Maybe if Zemire bothered speaking to me, I could ask him. By the time we reached our destination, I was ready to get my punishment over with. What grand thing was the witch going to do to me? The possibilities were infinite. I knew that the future princess couldn't kill me. Her father acquired me for a purpose. We're here, the guard said, before the flyer landed on another platform. The door slid open, and I exited the transport. The platform was filled with transports and well-dressed men and women in colorful clothes. The guard that had carried the princess up the stairs grabbed my arm and hustled me through the crowd. He led me down the stairs of the platform and down the path that led to a castle double the size of Lord Rima's. We met up with Anelli on the lawn. She scowled at the line of people that were waiting to gain entrance. "'What is this place?' I asked, confused. "'The Perk Estate,' Anelli answered, a bright smile on her face. I stiffened at the thought that we were at my father's home. What was this broad thinking? Was she trying to return me? Why are we here? I questioned, nerves making my voice shaky. That must have been what Anelli wanted to see, because she rolled her eyes. I can't believe that Zemire actually took pity on you. You're such a weakling, she said. Agitation filled me, and my fists clenched. I was dreaming of punching her square in the nose, but the guard that seemed to be assigned to the future princess appeared. To my utter disgust, he actually lifted the lazy woman into his arms and began carrying her like a baby. It took half an hour to file into the mansion. The foyer was practically painted with gold, making me understand why Lord Perk was always in debt. We were led down another hallway, with stunning murals and gold trim. The hallway went for a quarter of a mile. Eventually, we turned down another hallway that was a dead end. There were two guards, each of them dressed in green, holding open two ornate oak doors that led into an indoor stadium. I followed Anelli and the guard through the open doors and down an endless amount of stairs, until we reached the front row. Anelli plopped into one of the recliner seats, while I was directed to sit on another. The guard then nodded to Anelli and made the trek out of the stadium. Anelli glanced over at a raven-haired woman that was wearing a red dress. Since the section I was in was virtually empty, I easily overheard them. Is it set? Anelli demanded in Nerth. It is. I spoke to the obnoxious lady of the house, the woman with raven hair said, which made my pulse race. Was I going to be thrown into one of the stupid competitions? By the way, this is an utter waste of time, Anelli. I think that certain people need to be put in their place, the prince's woman replied as our section began to fill up. I was sitting in an end seat, which was lucky. At least I didn't have to deal with another pompous alien. I was beginning to think that the women of this planet were far worse than the men. The memory of the punishment beam still made me shiver. It was mostly psychological torture. A way to fool the brain into thinking that the body was in pain. It was a way to inflict punishment without harming a female. Did the punishment beams exist back in the days of my mother? I had no way to research that bit of information, since I had left the tablets in Lord Perk's spaceship. Thinking of the spaceship made my mind land on Molly, Amy, and Nina. Were they all right? Was I going to see them compete in an asinine competition that was created to dangle the hope of having a bride in front of desperate men? How much nerve had the others managed to learn? Did Karen outwardly act against them? What of hope and faith? Would they attend this stupid competition? The front rows were filling up with people representing different holdings. There was a private box where six ornate chairs sat. I had a feeling that the Lord and Lady hosted important guests in the box. I briefly wondered why Lady Anelli wasn't seated in such a place of honor. Maybe her engagement was a secret? Judging by how Lord Brima's daughter carried herself, I doubted that she could keep such news close to her vest. I bet that Lady Anelli was guilty of using her clout to get her way. Suddenly, a horn sounded, and the crowd got to their feet. Judging by the stunned expression on Lady Anelli's face, I had a feeling that this surprise wasn't a welcome one. 
The horn sounded three times, then the wall that was previously in front of me vanished, revealing the attraction. There was a stage constructed of wood with gold trim. To the left of the stage was what looked like an orchestra pit that was filled with dozens of men that were well-dressed. They each held a stick that had their names engraved at the top. I glanced into the box and saw a tall man with thick, black-cropped hair dressed in gold robes standing beside a stunning woman with red hair and a peaches-and-cream complexion. They both waved at the crowd before sitting in two of the seats. They were joined by Lord and Lady Perk and Gwen and David. My eyes were drawn to the seat that was across from the aisle. Someone familiar was standing in front of it. Prince Zemire stood there, his posture stiff, as if he was in the last place that he wanted to be. When his dark eyes met mine, he scowled, clearly blaming me for being at this deplorable event. My stupid heart didn't allow me to scowl back. Despite the fact that Zemire was off-limits, I still felt my pulse speeding up. His gaze was on mine until Lord Peric began speaking, his voice amplified by a cube-shaped device he held in his hand. Welcome to the Tournament of Brides, where lovely ladies compete to win the hand of our most eligible bachelors, he said, and a cheer went up in the room. Let me explain to you how it will go. The title gentleman will bid on the lady that wins the contests, while the commoners will bid on the woman that loses. The betting is now open. If you are willing to place a bet, then press the button on the side of your seat, and one of our bookies will assist you. Since father said the word bookie in English, it was obvious that he had stolen the concept from Vegas. Seriously? Why couldn't Lord Perrick bring an idea back from Earth like women's independence? I had to remind myself that the noble only cared about bringing his house out of debt. That was probably why he fathered so many children. If you would like refreshments, press the button located on your armrest. Now get seated. The first competition of the day is a fencing match. Fencing? I grew concerned for the safety of my sisters. They would not fare well in a fencing match. Well, Molly would. She was feisty enough to fight dirty. I tried to relax, reminding myself that these pointless competitions were for show. The women wouldn't be expected to fight to the death. I eased my breathing and listened to my father attempt to imitate a wrestling announcer. Now entering the stage is Anastasia Perk, an intelligent woman who enjoys horseback riding and dancing. Anastasia wore a knee-length gown that was so tight that she had problems moving. She held a sword in her hand, and it thankfully had a dulled point. Anastasia seemed to stand tall, despite how ridiculous her heels looked. The next woman joining us is Amy Perk, who enjoys reading. That was a bald-faced lie, but everyone gasped in surprise when Amy walked on stage wearing a silk jumpsuit. Her shoes were more sensible, and her hair was up in a bun. She held her sword confidently, as if she'd held it before. Remember, ladies, the rule is that the person that gets a chest shot will win the point. Now, touch swords. The ladies touched swords, Anastasia's expression telling me that she was actually determined to win. Why? If I were her, I would have sat on the stage and refused to perform. But I wasn't showered with father's attention, so didn't feel the need to make him proud. Now go. Anastasia glanced at Amy's sword as if she were focusing on it. The sword suddenly flew from Amy's hand. Things had sure changed. Amy was unsurprised by the move and eyed Anastasia with frustration. Anastasia moved to give Amy a chest shot, but Amy dodged her. The audience seemed baffled by how fast Amy moved. But then again, she had worn appropriate clothing. Anastasia focused on Amy, sweat dripping down her forehead. But Amy made herself a moving target. Amy sprung forward and lifted her sword from the floor. With quick movements, Amy scored the chest shot, which made the people that had bet on Amy cheer. Anastasia grew angry and lifted her hand. Amy abruptly dove to the stage floor the telekinetic force slamming into the wall, causing it to crack. I stared at my father, who seemed annoyed by the damage. I hoped that someone chose to bid on my sister, because if not, then she would surely be punished for causing damage. Hadn't one of the twins been married off for breaking a glass? Anastasia's distraction was Amy's gift, since she hit Anastasia another time with her foil in the chest. Amy did her dodging trick again and ran leaps around the stage to wear Anastasia out. Then she tapped Anastasia's chest for the third time, and Father's scowl was noticeable. The winner is Amy, 
he said with little enthusiasm. A buzzer sounded, which made my father's eyes light up. It would seem that there is a bid. Does any of the commoners in the pit want the lovely Anastasia? For a moment, no sticks were in the air. But then, a tall, thin man stood and reluctantly held up his stick. Six hundred Norethian credits! He shouted. That was rather low, as the Norethian currency was similar to America's currency in value. Twelve hundred! Another man shouted. This wasn't going as my father expected. More half-hearted bids were made, until a bored-looking man stood and yelled, Twelve thousand! Everyone that had been standing sat, and my father's mouth tightened. Going once, going twice, sold to Mesco Salomon, he said. Now a bid on Amy? A tall, handsome man got to his feet, his dark eyes gleaming with excitement. Forty thousand, he said. It was obvious that he had an interest in Amy, who looked surprised. My father looked relieved, seeming to be glad that someone bid on the daughter that he treated like trash. Going once, going twice, sold to Lord Hirogo, he called. Moments later, guards removed both women and the two men that had won my sisters left the pit. I hadn't been surprised that Amy sold for more than Anastasia, since she seemed to have more intelligence. Most of the commoners in the pit were probably spending their hard-earned money for the hopes of buying a bride. They weren't going to vote for someone who was pampered beyond belief. The man that received Anastasia didn't seem all that excited. He just looked relieved. As both brides were given to their grooms, I couldn't help but think that there had to be a better way to match up the women. Ladies and gentlemen, there will be another fencing match. Let me introduce Lena Peirk, a talented musician who enjoys going for long walks on the beach. Lena entered the stage, dressed in a green jumpsuit modeled after what I'd created. She had short black hair and a nose ring. Some people murmured about her appearance. Father looked especially surprised by how one of his favorites was dressed, but he didn't say a word. The next contestant is Molly Peirk. He didn't even put a tidbit of information about my sister in the sentence. Two guards forced Molly on stage, her bruised face causing outrage in the crowd. Once she was released, a guard nervously handed her a sword. Molly immediately pulled the tip off the sword and charged the guards. She moved so quickly that they didn't even have a chance. She slashed at one while kicking the other in the shins. Her kick was so powerful that the guard crumpled to the floor. She eyed Lena, who nodded. This must have been something coordinated. Lena ran toward the third guard, her hands clenched into fists. The buzzer sounded, which halted all action. Gentlemen, you can't bid on the females until the competition... One million on the redhead, a tall blonde said, his eyes filled with excitement. Chapter 35 Jade, Naretha, The Peirk Estate Uh, sold to Lord Gersh, my father said, which made Molly scowl. Gwen looked at Molly, and she stiffened, then nodded. Lord Gersh stormed out of the pit and joined his new bride on stage. He didn't seem thrilled by the prospect, which was strange. Molly threw down her sword and leaped into his arms, which made the crowd cheer. He carried her backstage before my sister could cause any more trouble. Lena stood there, a wide grin on her face. I hadn't gotten to know her, but I had the feeling that she was a badass. Five hundred thousand! A short, skinny man said, waving his baton in the air like he was hailing a taxi. Sold to Lord Brick, Lord Peirk said and the skinny man dashed to Lena and extended his hand. She dropped her sword and took it. When the defiant pair left the stage, the crowd cheered. All right, let's move on to the third bout, my father said. And for the record, since neither women competed, you're free to place your money on the next bout. I heard cheers, which was disappointing. How many people would go hungry because they got caught up in the event? One of Sheena's foster dads had a gambling problem. His compulsive spending caused his family to go without food for long periods. The first contestant is Karen Peirk, who is brilliant, kind, and has a knack for painting. Karen strolled onto the stage, clutching a beautiful gold sword that had its point covered. Her black hair was in an updo, the curls framing the sides of her face. Her makeup was flawless, giving her a beauty that she didn't possess without it. She wore a black gown that was knee-length, 
but her beautiful gold-studded boots were more sensible than Anastasia's shoes had been. Karen stood there and appeared as though she had the competition in the bag. It didn't take me long to understand the reason for her confidence. The next contestant is Nina, who loves cuddling small animals and loves caring for children. Nina walked onto the stage, and a chuckle brought my eyes to the evil lady that had dragged me here. She pressed the button under her seat, and a robot came toward her. She pressed a button on the robot's chest, and a screen appeared where its stomach used to be. I didn't want to look, because I knew that she was betting on Karen. My father gave the audience plenty of time to bet, since it was obvious who would win this match. Ladies, commence, my father ordered. Moments later, Karen ran toward Nina, who appeared petrified. I wanted to jump onto the stage and protect my fragile sister. The injustice pissed me off. What kind of person forced a sweet girl like Nina to compete with someone as cruel as Karen? Karen had to resort to chasing her around the stage. Nina was too quick to even be touched. Karen spun around, trying to keep track of Nina, whom I could barely spot, when Nina suddenly jabbed Karen's chest with her sword. Most of the audience booed, including Lady Anelli. Karen scowled as sweat began pouring down her face. Nina used that tactic to trick Karen into receiving a second strike to the chest. Karen shouted, and before Nina could avoid Karen's sword, Karen caught Nina in the chest. The audience gasped when the sword plunged into Nina's body. No! I screamed as Nina collapsed to the ground. Karen let out an ear-piercing scream and fell to her knees. Karen's eyes grew wide, as if she couldn't believe what had happened. I could tell by her pale complexion that her reaction was genuine. Anger filled my chest at the realization that Lady Anelli's companion did something to sabotage the match. My father's eyes filled with shock. I eyed Lady Valera, who appeared indifferent. Gwen stood, her anger freezing my breath. Lady Valera must have said something foul, because Gwen's hands began to glow. I gasped at the sight of the king and queen dropping to the floor of the box to avoid Gwen's wrath. My father's mouth was moving rapidly but Gwen wasn't listening. She gestured at a frightened Lady Valera, and the woman turned to Ash right in front of our eyes. My father's expression grew horrified when Gwen suddenly vanished. I didn't have time to think about where my sister had gone. Some of the members of the audience began shouting no. I glanced at the stage just in time to see Karen yank out the sword. My eyes widened in fear as blood flowed out of Nina's body. Karen stared down at the wound, then pressed her hand into it. Karen's hand began to glow as Nina arched her back. Moments later, Karen removed her hand, and Nina slowly sat up. Lady Anelli let out a curse as the audience applauded Karen. Karen stood and glanced up at the box. She frowned, obviously concerned by the shortage of people in the box. She eyed my father, who was shaking like a leaf. Gwen's angry actions had surprised him. Nina appeared frightened, her eyes full of fear. Bring Karen another sword. She... she is well enough to continue. This man was so money-hungry that he was going to force Karen and Nina to continue fencing? Even Lady Anelli seemed surprised by the development. The king and queen got back in their seats, their unamused expressions telling me that my father was going to hear an earful. I looked at the pit and was surprised to see an imposing man on his feet, his baton in the air. Lady Anelli sucked in a breath. She obviously knew this man. Five million credits for both of the women. To hell with the rules, he announced. Nina obviously wanted out, because she picked up her sword and jabbed Karen in the chest. Most of the audience groaned when my father was forced to declare Nina the winner. Five million credits for both women. Going once, going twice, sold to Lord Rima. Horror and excitement filled my stomach at the thought that Nina would be in the harem with me, but I wasn't sure about Karen. She had been horrible to Molly, but she had also saved Nina's life, which meant that she wasn't all bad. Great, Lady Anelli grumbled. Lord Rima strolled on stage and held out an arm for each woman, then glanced right at me. Surprise marred his face for a moment, but then he glanced over at Lady Anelli. The fury in his eyes told me that this hadn't been a sanctioned trip. What was going to happen to the headstrong lady? Miss Peirk, a male voice said. I glanced over at Zemire, who was stone-faced. I stood, knowing that I couldn't snub the prince. I had so many questions. Why had he been avoiding me? When was he going to marry Lady Anelli? Why hadn't he been sitting in the box with his parents? He held out an arm for me, and I gladly took it. Moments later, 
Six soldiers surrounded us, and we headed for Lord Rima, who was still on stage with the women that he acquired. As soon as I had reached my sisters, we were ushered backstage. What in the hell are you doing here? Zemire yelled. Lady Anelli ordered for me to come with her, I responded, figuring that I could just tell the truth. Yeah, and I bet she had to beg you to come. No, your fiancé wanted to teach me a lesson, so she had her friend rig Nina's fencing match to punish me. She knew that Nina's death would hurt me, I yelled at him. We stood there, nose to nose, our eyes on one another. I don't have a fiancé, the prince protested. Yeah, of course. You're the kind of guy that makes promises that he can't keep, I accused. Come on, Jade. No need to tempt the prince. For all we know, he'll get you beheaded, Karen urged as she pulled on my arm. I nodded and allowed Karen to take me away from the prince. We were led up a flight of stairs, then out into the humid air. The six soldiers that had escorted Zemire and I onto the stage stayed behind with the playboy prince. I'm completely healed, Nina told me as she linked her arm through mine. Karen mirrored my sister's actions, and we all walked together. Karen, thank you for helping Nina, I said, and she nodded. I had no idea that there was something wrong with my sword, Karen said. I think that Lady Anelli's friend telekinetically did something to it, I assured my sister. Lord Rima walked up ahead, content for us to follow him. As I walked toward the platform, I hoped that my sisters and I were heading toward a better future. Chapter 36 Lena, Naretha, In Flight I took a sip of my glass of wine as soon as the luxury flyer was stable. On the seat beside me was one confused redhead. Amy was secured in the seat behind me. Oh, ladies, it will all work out for us. Don't worry, I said as I took another swig. What happened to the men that bought us? Molly wondered, a brow arched. They technically didn't buy us, I corrected. I bought us. What? Molly and Amy asked in unison. I relaxed back in my seat and decided that I would tell my sisters the truth. I grew up on Naretha, remember? That means I have had years to come up with a plan. Ever since I was twelve, I've had visions. At first, it started out as flashes. I'd get glimpses of crashing markets, bad business ventures, and opportunities. At first, I'd write the stuff down, in case I needed it for later. It wasn't until I was thirteen when I overheard my father talking to Leah. He talked about going to Earth and seducing more women. The problem is, none of the women that he had children with willingly slept with him. Father's sister, Treen, lives on Earth. She locates, then mentally controls women of my father's choosing. I guess I had always thought that the women in Dad's harem had always wanted to be there. My sense of justice couldn't let this continue. But I was only a thirteen-year-old girl. What could I do? Jack Crap. Molly responded while I took another sip of wine. Exactly, I said. It wasn't until I was fourteen when the glimpses turned into straight-up visions. I saw it all. The bidding. What would become of all of us. I was determined to change it. So, I snuck out of the palace and found a poor commoner who would take all of my advice. That was easy. So, he began amassing a fortune, saving credits for me. As soon as I turned seventeen, I approached the lords that bid on you guys. I told them that if they bid on you, I'd pay the bid and pay them handsomely. They agreed, since they were nearly destitute. Now, we are on our way to the headquarters of the Resistance, I announced. Resistance? Amy asked. What's that? A safe haven that I built. As soon as we arrive, our trackers and crystals will be removed. Then, we will lie low until Jade's friends come, I informed my sisters. What friends? Amy squeaked. Dad made a huge mistake by taking my twin. She's kind and well-loved. Once her people come, he will be destroyed. This has been Captive Treasure, First Generation, Age of Chaos, Book One. Written by Debbie Civil. Narrated by Camille Laakea Wong. Copyright 2021 by Debbie Civil. Production copyright by Debbie Civil.